Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, 22nd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are in silent? You can use your mobile phones for social media, but please don't. Take photographs or record proceedings. We have received apologies from Jenny Go Ruth and Miles Briggs. Um, the first item on our agenda is the selection of a new uh, EU rapporteur for the committee. Um, could I invite any nominations? In fact, we're going to uh, nominate two European rapporteurs for the committee. Alex? Convener, may I nominate Brian Whistle, please? Okay. And Convener, can I nominate Marie Todd? <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, nominations? Okay. Can we agree that? Thank you. Um, second item on the agenda is a roundtable session on phase two of our inquiry into sport for everyone. We have just over an hour for this session and uh, we have a number of guests today and you're very welcome to the committee. Uh, I'll introduce myself and then we'll go around the table and you can introduce yourself. Um, my name is Neil Finlay, I'm uh, Lothian's uh, Labour MSP and I'm the chair of the Health and Sport Committee. I'm Claire Hockey, I'm the MSP for Rutherglen. I'm Alan Johnston from Scott, the Sport Social Enterprise Coordinator. I'm Tom Arthur, I'm the MSP for Renfrewshire South. I'm Catherine Byrne, I'm Policy Manager at Chess Heart and Strike Scotland. Malcolm Dingle-Smith from Sport Scotland. I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Weston and my party's health spokesperson. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. I'm Kenneth Evans, I'm Chair of the Scots Association of Local Sports Councils. Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Um, Brian Whittle, MSP, South of Scotland and Party Spokesman, Health, Education, Lifestyle and Sport. I'm Alison McCollum from Public Health in, Scot in the Borders. I'm here on behalf of a range of partner organisations who submitted jointly. <coughs> I'm Marie Todd, MSP for the Highlands and Islands and apologies for my late arrival. I came down from Orkney this morning. Hey, I'm Ewan McMartin, Volunteer Scotland Disclosure Services Manager. I'm uh, Colin Smith, MSP for the South of Scotland and my party's spokesperson on public health and social care. OK, thank you. We'll try and keep the discussion this morning as free-flowing as possible, so please just indicate if you want to come in um, and members will ask a few questions uh, as we go. Uh, Claire, do you want to begin? Thank you, Convener, and uh, welcome to uh, all of the, the panel here this morning. Um, I was going to kick off with just asking if uh, you could provide us with some examples of where sport has made a difference to communities or to individuals, and what was the evidence that it had made a difference? Who would like to start? Yes. Um, I'm speaking on, on, as the chair of Scots Association of Local Sports Councils, um, but I'm also treasurer of Berwickshire Sports Council. Uh, one of our principal aims is to support athletes um, at uh, varying levels, from the very local level to international level, um, and we award them uh, grants uh, for, for that. Um, depending on the level that they, they are. We then ask them to supply us with information as to how successful they have been uh, receiving that money. And we also support clubs um, who are requiring upgrade to their uh, facilities and we get feedback from them as well as to how successful uh, their project has, has gone. Where do you get your money from? We get our money from uh, Live Borders, which is a, a, a leisure trust. Um, there are four uh, councils, uh, sports councils in, in the borders, Berwickshire, Etrigamodadale, Roxburgh and Tweeddale, and they are all given uh, a, a percentage of the money uh, from the pot, depending on the size of the population in the area that they administer. So directly from the local authority? It's from, it goes from the local authority to the leisure trust, and then the leisure trust give it out after, after them. Anybody else want to come in? Yep. Um, for there are half a million people living with heart and lung conditions or with a stroke, it's often not sport they're aspiring to participate in, it's being physically active because it's hugely important for them in the secondary prevention of a further stroke or heart attack or an exacerbation of their lung condition. Um, and we know there are enormous <coughs> barriers for these people in being physically active. Just last week, the Scottish Household Survey 
um, produced evidence that only 39% of people living with long-term health conditions are able to be physically active against a national average of 79%. So just to highlight to the committee today that sport, whilst important, is very much a subset of overarching physical activity and how important that is to, to many people living with long-term conditions. Alan? Yeah, just to actually echo that as well in terms of the sport social enterprise network I represent, which is about 140 organisations. It's as much about the physical activity in the intentionality to make a difference to people's lives. So it's hard to pick out one particular organisation, but it is about the intentionality to get people active, to make a difference to their life, and also the, the affordability issue as well, to make sure people and families can afford the activity. Uh, Alison? Continue on that theme of, of physical activity and the importance of widening access to that, because in, in addition to this, the sports activities, which uh, my colleague has referred to in, in Scottish Borders, we have a number of different initiatives promoted through partners really to engage with some of the communities who might not be um, as readily um, able to access opportunities to be active, and that includes people who have long-term health conditions and, and specific referral routes for them, but also much many more community-based activities in village halls, in local centres, um, which are particularly um, uh, much appreciate, are very much appreciated by people who don't have access to local leisure facilities and transport being a particular issue in the rural areas. So we hear a lot of very positive report back about the improvements to people's well-being, um, the reduction in social, social isolation and the increase in confidence. And that applies across a whole range, a wide age range, including older people. Um, so I think that understanding of sport and physical activity has been closely interlinked is, is really important because some people will be physically active and become to then move on to become more engaged in informal structured sport of some kind. But for a lot of people, it's an increased level of physical activity that really has the major impact. Welcome. At the national level, we're seeing the, the growth in the big programmes, the governing body club membership in active schools membership, and we're seeing the physical activity benefits that that brings and the health benefits that come from that. At the micro level, though, we're beginning to see a lot of interesting work. Um, for instance, Dalry Community Sports Hub that worked with 10 unemployed people to build up their skills um, and see that those 10 people, five of them went on to college, three secured places, several of them have started volunteering, and a couple of them got jobs now as a result. So it's the that large-scale health benefits, but we shouldn't also ignore the smaller benefits that are coming from communities looking at new and innovative work. Yeah, Alan? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work going on at the moment that you'll be aware of uh, in terms of sport for change, and uh, I think sport for change is a good way of actually demonstrating the difference that sports clubs and community clubs can make in things like employability, social inclusion, um, and even there's projects addressing things like homelessness. And the, the Sport for Change research that's recently been undertaken and the work through Sports Scotland, uh, that they're taking a leadership role, I think, can only be uh, better for the community and population and their health. So, but, but as a committee, obviously, carrying out an inquiry into sport for everyone, and we're keen to, to be able to highlight what good pieces of work are being done in places. So what are the what is the recipe for success in getting people physically active? And I take on board Alison McCollum's point about physical activity in sport. Yeah. <laughs> For, about the importance of community-based support. We have around 60 groups across the country providing physical activity in a variety of forms and they're very much led by the local community and they meet local needs so they might be providing, for example, a walking group, they might be um, a gym-based exercise class led by um, a qualified exercise instructor who can support people specifically with health conditions. They may sometimes be seat-based exercises um, for people with disabilities um, and more older and frail people. So one of the keys to success there, I think, is very much in that local support, that peer-based support as well, where people can go to groups um, with other people who are experiencing similar health conditions for them and importantly build up social networks as well, which is vitally important in keeping them attending on a regular basis. Alison? Yes, uh, thank you. Really similarly to follow up on, on um, 
a theme. We have found that one of the opportunities that's given communities more opportunity, more chance to work out the kinds of physical activity they would enjoy themselves is through participatory budgeting. So we've had a pilot for participatory budgeting in the Burnfoot community in Hoyk, which is an area of, of long-standing high deprivation. And it was really quite astounding without too many um, conditions put around the funding, how many of the applications for that funding were related to activity, physical activity related um, opportunities for particular gr age groups or within certain settings. So that included things like a boxing club breakfast for, for kids in school to um, purchasing bikes and, and cycling uh, classes for, for children who wouldn't have had those opportunities within their family. So I think there was a, a principle behind that for me that was quite striking about the importance of giving local communities the resources to make the kinds of choices around what they, the initiatives they would like um, and, and not constraining the range of activity that we think is, is preferable for that particular community. Brian, do you want to come on? Thanks, uh, convener. I think to go on from what I, I uh, failed to try and say last week around uh, this, um, we're saying sport for all. I think we've got to be really careful here because the majority of people that are physically active are not doing sport. So I think we've got, that's, that's kind of what I asked the question from last week about what do, what, what do we mean by sport. Um, I mean, a lot of physical activity leads on to sport, but the majority of people, as I said, doing physical activity are not doing sport. Um, and I think we've got to be, you know, I think with that in mind when we're doing our, our investigation here, uh, we've got to keep. We've got to bear that in mind. Is that um, you know, sport for me is, is is competitive physical activity, and the majority of people don't do that. You know, if you're doing jog Scotland, for example, is physical activity. It's not sport. You know, if you're doing aqua aerobics or you're doing a, a class at the gym, or you're, that's not sport. That's physical activity. So, so is it your view that if if um, if there's no competitive element, then it's not sport? Correct. Sport is competitive activity. Uh, you know, Tell me I'm wrong. I would, I would, show, show, me, show, me, show me an example of that's not true. Well, I play golf badly, but I don't play competitive golf. Yes, you do. So therefore, I don't play sport. I would disagree with you. Do you, you try, do you try and beat, what, beat the course every week? <laughs> I wonder what others would say to that. Tell Mr Whitley's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Sport Scotland would certainly take a slightly wider view of sport um, and say that, for instance, in Jog Scotland, if you're running a 5k every week, you're potentially competing against yourself to bring your time down and that that you, you may well view that for yourself as sport. It is true that different people will view sport differently. Say the household survey says that 52% of adults and 66% of children have played sport in the last... Um, four weeks. So to say that it isn't the majority, I'd say it is the majority of people, but it isn't, I would agree, the answer for absolutely everyone, particularly um, when we begin to look at getting the inactive active. Um, in terms of Claire's question about how do we, um, what what is the secret to it? I mean, again, I think the answer is there's no secret, but picking up on some of the points others have made, particularly in schools environments and active schools, we're seeing much more of a move towards talking to, ch to young children and young people about what is it that they want to do, making sure we involve the children and young people in the planning of the sport. Similarly, with the community sport hub model, it's very much not an imposed programme from above. It's about understanding um, what works in each different community. And I think you heard that from Glasgow last week. But also, I mean, there are barriers to sport that we should recognise um, that particular groups face, whether that's people with disabilities, um, whether that's older people and the work that needs to be done with each individual sport to understand for their sport what are the barriers to that and what can be done I think is part of the work and that's certainly work that Sport Scotland has been undertaking but it's still certainly more to do in that area. Alex? Thank you, convener. Um, picking up on Brian Whittle's uh, discussion about whether physical activity is sport, I mean, as a surfer and a scuba diver, I mean, these are sports to me, but I don't compete in them, as, as I'm sure anyone who around this table as a runner um, will run for pleasure and for fitness, and that's a sport. You don't go to any other section of the department store to buy your running gear other than the sports section. So I, I think the competitive edge here actually speaks to a wider issue, because I know that I remark on one of the comments we heard at the start of the meeting, that 38% of those with long-term conditions only um, engage in any kind of physical activity. And that chimes with an experience we had in uh, in our sort of field trips to particularly in the Millennium Centre in my constituency when one of the uh, people we were speaking to about why they weren't engaged in sport was the embarrassment that they were they felt they were overweight and which would look silly in a tracksuit but also this slight 
an anxiety about the competitive nature of sport. And, and I, you know, I think we all have horrific childhood memories of being forced to compete and coming off badly um, and that being a barrier. So I, I, I would sort of com contend to <laughs> Brian that, that competition has its edge, but but the elite aspect of sport can be quite inhibiting. And I'd be really interested to hear whether the panel view um, that there is an elite barrier to participation in physical activity or perceived barrier anyway. Okay, uh, um, there aren't many um, official reports that have sentences that start as a surfer and a scuba diver, <laughs> but we'll give you. Um, would then you like to comment on that? Uh, Brian, please come I, back. I, I'm going to comment on that. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually trying to help here <laughs> in that particular, I mean, com the competitiveness of sport, especially at a young age, is actually what I, uh, I think is a massive barrier to the long-term participation. And that's kind of where I am. I'm trying to, I'm trying to lead with this. Um, you'll, you'll not be surprised to say that, that I'm, I'm listen, I, I don't mind listening to your opinion now before I tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, the, 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 I think this, that we, we, we highlight an issue here can be in that, we invest, that our investigation hasn't been nailed down to what we actually, you know, there's a variety of uh, opinions around the table of what sport actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, is, is an issue here uh, for me in terms of what we're actually investigating. Being physically active, is, for me, is what we need to be. Okay. Um, can, I, can I come to an issue about um, funding and, and where, uh, um, where we should be putting that money because we've heard uh, from Alison about money that goes to um, community projects right at the grassroots and, and throughout our deliberations we've heard that um, criticisms of Sports Scotland that they overly concentrate on the elite level at the expense of the grassroots sport activity. Sport activity. That might be a legitimate criticism, it may not be, but I'd be interested to hear the views of the panel as to if, where, if we are putting the money in the right places to get more people active. Yes, Alan. Yeah, I, I mentioned Sport for Change earlier and there, there is a large piece of work there in looking at sport and physical activity and you've got organisations like the Robertson Trust that are looking to fund activity that is, isn't is just about that sport and elite and sort of picking up on Mr Whittle's point about the competitive competitiveness which is really important but there's also the fun and social interaction that you're getting organisations like the Robertson Trust and Sports Scotland I think starting to recognise has been important to fund. Yeah but what we're trying to get at is are they putting enough money into that area or is the balance wrong? But at the moment, they're not putting enough money into that area, but I would like to say they're trying to address that at the moment. Uh, Ivan. Yeah, hi. Great discussion we've started off with. Um, I, I suppose I'd just like to get some reflections from, um, from the, the people around the table on what the objective is. Now, there's clearly the um, proportion of adults meeting the physical activity could, could standard. Can I stop you there, Ivan? Sorry. Can I bring you in after this? Sure, that's fine. People wanted to come in and that funding. No problem. I'll bring you in in the next one. Hey, Kenneth. Uh, yeah. From SARSC, um, because we work with all the, <coughs> the local sports Scotland uh, councils throughout Scotland, of which at present there are 38, one of the big things that we continually hear from them is that um, because of the pressures that are put on either local authorities or, or leisure trusts, the amount of money that is going to these sports councils is getting less and less every year. Um, some of the sports councils are, are, are very good and have ad addressed this by looking at different ways of raising, raising funds through going out and trying to get working with uh, companies, sponsorship and, and whatever. But there are one or two who have just decided that they just cannot continue to, to keep going in the way that they would like to go to support athletes and, and, and clubs. And it's just it just comes down to the pressures that they are being, being put under. Alison? I'm not sure if it speaks directly to your question, but um, from a public health point of view, it won't surprise you to know that I'm particularly interested in looking at the inequalities focus in this. And I think one of the tensions that we are aware of locally is that the uh, sports 
clubs and the trusts are very much um, have a responsibility to many, maintain the facilities and premises that they have um, oversight of, and that that sometimes narrows the opportunities then to engage with the wider community and pr provide opportunities for a whole range of different community groups. So there's something about the overhead costs and the, the need to keep membership levels up and um, all, all of the maintenance of that infrastructure, which is obviously important, but I think there's a tension there sometimes with what we're trying to do and to stimulate a wider um, engagement with physical activity for the whole population. I, d I think that's um, something that, that's not insurmountable, but it's probably quite hard to quantify where the, the, the balance of the resources goes, because it's easy, easier to identify what gets spent on sports facilities than it is to identify what particular funding goes into physical activity promotion because it's so diverse and it's being used, it's being accessed and promoted through a whole range of different funding streams and initiatives, which might not be badged as being directly about that, but use activity as a way to build skills, encourage volunteering, combat isolation. So there's a lot of kind of unintended benefits coming through a lot of other routes. Do, do you see any deliberate policy of um, skewing funding to areas of most need um not at the not sufficiently at the moment i think that i think that's very difficult to do and it would be good to see more of that coming in in the future definitely uh, catherine just on the, on the funding issue it's a systemic issue in the sense that it um, extends from nhs care and beyond so people after for example a heart attack or a stroke um, or a diagnosis of a <coughs> lung condition um, are provided with NHS rehabilitation programmes and physical activity is a core component of that. And we know that when people can access rehabilitation and complete those programmes, they're far more likely to be physically active months later and able to sustain the benefits of that. But the provision of that, that rehabilitation is very patchy across the different health boards. We recently conducted a survey of pulmonary rehabilitation provision across the 14 regional health boards, um, which found that capacity is only about 9,000, but we estimate around 69,000 people across the country would hugely benefit from that. Yeah. Malcolm, do you want to come in at this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I think it would be unsurprised to learn that probably I have a different take on Sports Scotland spend. Um, so I think in terms of performance versus elite, the uh, sorry, performance versus grassroots sport, the majority of our budget goes on um, grassroots sport. I think having followed the committee's evidence, what I've heard is a lot of references to active schools and to community sports hubs and the good work they're doing, and that is Sports Scotland funded programmes. Um, in addition, we do put money directly into clubs and to coaches, so we put um, direct club investment into 122 clubs, we put um, funded 3,300 coaches directly last year with subsidies to, to undertake coaching qualifications, we put money out through awards for all and facilities. Um, I think some of the evidence has been, I've heard um, you take has been around whether it is money going directly into clubs versus money going into governing bodies and local authorities for staffing posts. Um, I think there's a balance to be struck there. I think that we can underestimate the amount of value that an individual supporting a club can put in, um, that sometimes, particularly volunteers who are time limited, the ability to have a professional provide them support is of more use than um, direct uh, subsidy. Um, and just finally, I would say it is also important to note that in terms of overall public spend on sport, we are only 10% of that budget and 90% of the sports budget is through local authorities. Um, could I ask Alison, Colin and Brian, is it on this funding issue that you want in? Yeah. I'll come back to you then. Alison, is it funding? Um, not particularly. Right, I'll take Brian know. first then. It's just to, it's to come on from you. Know, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, Ayrshire and Arne are doing a really excellent programme just now around stroke rehabilitation in the community, around the exercise programme. I think there's some fantastic evidence around cutting the number of, 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 uh, of the re emissions. Uh, I just want to point that out, thanks. Um, I was actually to, to take a, a point from, from Malcolm there around um, we seem to be focusing on the Sports Scotland Fund and actually the overall sports budget. Uh, I said predominantly through um, I was at half a billion goes through the the, uh, uh, the councils and I wonder what the committee's views have, have we actually looked at that as well in the round rather than just focusing completely on the Sports Scotland budget Yeah we have several times we've taken evidence for various people who are raising issues about cuts to local government having a huge impact on um, grassroots yep. sport and sport activity and the ability of trusts and uh, local government directly to fund 
projects. I think it's important to look at around because the, the inequalities are going to be focused more, pro probably more directly through or more uh, through local government. It's going to be more targeted. Um, Ivan. Um, so so it's, it's kind of related. It was, it was to go back to what is it we're, we're trying to achieve, and there's clearly in the, in the national performance indicators as a metric um, proportion of adults meeting the physical activity recommendations, um, and that number's been kind of in the low 60s for a, for a number of years. So I suppose the question I've got is the organisations around the table, do you see that as your primary objective? or one of your objectives, or is that an objective that we shouldn't be focused on at all, or are there others that are more important? Um, and if you think it is important, what are you actually doing with the resources you've got to move that forward? And clearly within that, you talk about 37% don't meet it, and hard to reach in disadvantaged groups, that percentage is obviously going to be higher, potentially much higher. So how does that figure in your, your focus as well? Anyone like to kick us off? Catherine? Um, yes, it's hugely important to us. We've just launched a three-year initiative where we're going to focus particularly on enabling the people we support to be more physically active in different ways. So we'll be testing new um, local community support. We'll be piloting new ways of reaching more people and addressing some of those inequalities that, that Colin mentioned. Um, and just to reiterate again how important physical activity is for the people we support in not only helps them regain their lives. Some people are, can be literally trapped in the house without sufficient support to be physically active. Um, but people who are able to be physically active um, are far more likely to be able to participate in their community, to build a, a network around them, to self-manage <coughs> their conditions, and importantly, less likely to be readmitted to hospital and to have to visit their GP repeatedly. So savings there to be made as well for the NHS. Yeah, Alison? better come in quickly on the savings to the NHS, which is always a, a welcome message. Um, we've heard quite a bit about rehabilitation, but I'd also like to highlight how important physical activity is and, and increasing that, particularly for the most inactive, in relation to prevention, because we know that there's a, a tidal wave of long-term conditions likely to, um, to come at us if we don't do something soon, really, about given the, um, the, the population profile in terms of ageing, given the increasing prevalence of obesity and overweight in Scotland and the continuing low levels of physical activity among many um, people in, in different types of communities. So one of the things that we're beginning to get more into in the, in the Scottish borders is to look at the role of physical activity as a preventative measure, and we're looking at introducing a diabetes prevention programme to really ta target er um, um, groups of the population who are likely to be much more at risk, and physical activity is one of the main ways in which we can engage with that population and, and, and have some impact. We've had a very promising pilot uh, on quite a small scale, but that's already <coughs> shown some quite significant gains in terms of clinical improvements for those individuals um, and a lot of very, uh, very strong reported uh, improvements in their own health and well-being and their social connectedness and, and sense of um, control over their own lives. So I think we see that as an area of uh, where there's a huge scope for development and obviously having an inequalities focus in that would be absolutely critical. Anyone else like to come in? Yeah, Malcolm. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I th the, in terms of the physical activity levels, um, at 9.30 this morning, the latest health survey statistics released, which you're right, despite me, still no statistically significant increase in adult participation. There's a small increase. There is a statistically significant increase in um, children's participation. Um, showing an increase um, up to 76% of children um, reaching the recommended level, um, particular increase since 2008 in girls' participation, interestingly, from 64 to 72%. Um, in terms of the sport bit, though, and as I say, we ex absolutely accept that we, we want to see that increasing. We want to see that moving um, more than it currently is. What's interesting to us is that when we look at our large-scale programmes, we are seeing growth in those large-scale programmes in sports participation. Um, and I think this shows that whilst structured sport, actually, the picture is looking pretty positive. That's against a backdrop of an ageing population, a backdrop of changes in lifestyles and changes of culture. Um, so we do need to look at how collectively we work to address that, how we adjust the design of sport. We're seeing more sports clubs offering different types of opportunities, going back to Brian's point about um, what does and doesn't count in sport. We're seeing sports clubs certainly offering a wider variety of activities and things that are more likely to attract people in through the door. I, I could ream off a whole list of examples, but I think you've heard a lot of those from our partners. Yeah. 
See, see the, you talk about large scale programmes. Mm -hmm. What kind of examples? So, are so active schools, we're talking um, up to 290,000 children taking part in that. Governing body membership, you're looking at 770,000 members of sports clubs. So those kind of. One of the programmes that appeared to be really successful was Jog Scotland, mm -hmm. and yet that had its funding chopped. Why was that? So Jog Scotland uh, is being funded. Um, yeah, but it had it chopped. From it's now been funded via SAMH. Uh, so it's it's been funded through, via Sports Scotland as well. Um, it has received funding from SAMH, but so that was that a reversal of the cut. Uh, it was a decision taken to put the, fun the funding in, having initially um, initially it had been funded directly by Scottish government. That money had moved to us. Um, there'd been a reduction in that funding. There was always an intention to reduce that funding and an understanding that that funding would re reduce. Um, that was because we were looking at the sustainability of the programme. We've been working hard with Scottish Athletics to look at that. Um, we believed, and our conversations with Scottish Athletics had been that, that um, by the end of the last financial year, they would be in a position to carry on without that funding. Um, we'd put a little bit of extra money in as a kind of stopgap measure. At the beginning of this year, it became apparent that they weren't going to be able to continue it without that funding, so we put funding back in, yes. Nothing to do with political pressure? Um, I, there, a number of politicians certainly wrote to us to say um, locally they'd had discussions with their local clubs, uh, local Jog Scotland groups, um, who had um, said that it was providing a valuable service, that, um, that it needed the money to carry on and identified that same gap. So, I mean, we welcome politicians taking an interest in local sport and raising the same issues that we were hearing from Scottish Athletics. So the question I have to ask then is, had that intervention not been made, would you have reinstated that money anyway? With um, if the in intervention by politicians hadn't been made, or government, or whoever or, was putting but, pressure on, like it, well, the conversation we had with um, with Scottish Athletics was that the money was needed, so we put it back in. Okay, um, Alison, um, can I just carry on for, for a moment mm -hmm. on that? Uh, the fact that there's been very little change in meeting the latest physical activity recommendations. I mean, you've spoken about a small increase in adult adults meeting it and a, a, and a more promising increase in children, but we seem to have been stuck more or less since 2008. You know, what do we have to do to increase that figure? Because otherwise, you know, there's a recommendation there that far too many people aren't meeting. Do you have any suggestions as to what needs to change? Yeah, I think my view is it needs a really concerted effort across partners on this, and that isn't just about sport. It comes back to this. Sport is a contributor to physical activity, but it's not the only part of physical activity. That we'd be looking at active travel, we'd be looking at um, active living, we'd be looking at dance, we'd be looking at play, and that all these different parts of physical activity need to come together. And at the moment, there is a temptation to put the entire responsibility for that onto sport, but actually I, our view would be that it needs all public sector organisations and other third sector, private sector pulling together if we're actually going to make a real impact on that goal. Okay, thank you. Can I ask another yeah, question then of, of Sport mm -hmm. Scotland? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the school estate, your audit of the school estate showed that around 61% of available indoor space in secondary schools is used during term time, and that drops to 43% during holidays. Outdoors is even lower. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a weather impact there, but 40% of outdoor space used during term time, dropping to 28% in holidays. Seems a bit sort of, you know, you might expect that more spaces might be used more in, during the holidays. And also, there's a there's a real difference. 73% of the space that is used is regular extended lets, and I think those things are quite difficult to access for community groups. You know, you're looking at people making bookings, getting that amount of money together up front, and you know the proportion of casual use is pretty low at 26%. So, uh, you know, why is usage so low? This is a huge asset for us. How can that be increased? Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I'd say a regular extended let will generally be held by a sports club, for instance, a community group, and it doesn't necessarily require upfront payment. Um, but I think, I think you're right. What the audit showed was that accessibility was high, that um, the ability to book um, facilities at some time is high, that something like 98% of secondary school facilities um, are available at some time for community booking, but what isn't necessarily the case is that isn't a consistent availability. And so, I mean, obviously schools are, are run by local authorities or in some cases by leisure trusts um, or 
other operators outside of school time. And I think that's where the challenge potentially is, is that what we're seeing is that it's about the management systems, it's about the how, how are we booking those systems, um, how, is, how can somebody book a casual let? It's not as easy to book a badminton court in a school in some cases than it is um, a badminton court in a leisure centre, and that clearly is a problem if you're trying to encourage um, accessibility. Um, that comes down to working with each local authority, to working with each operator to look at how that system of management can be improved rather than just assuming um, that schools aren't available. It's about how they're managed, I would say. So that, you know, you were saying previously, if we're going to tackle physical mm -hmm. inactivity, it has to be about partnership working. But we don't seem to have quite cracked that yet when it comes to access to that estate. And I suppose maybe part of the reason that usage is low during the holiday period is because janitors, for example, are on holiday. I mean, surely it can't be. In this day and age, we must be able to get together to have a model that makes these facilities available all year round. Um, yeah, I mean, so partly it'll be about um, availability. But it depends, on again, on the model to which the school operates. So, for instance, quite a lot of the schools in the Highlands are run by Highland Leisure Trust, um, by uh, High Life Highlands, who I think you've taken evidence from. And that model certainly allows you to get around those problems of um, the janitor because you're effectively using a much larger staffing base who are able to move between um, locations rather than relying on the janitor unlocking the door. I think you'd find that model of having a single janitor um, who's responsible for unlocking the door is a decreasing model, um, is something we're seeing less of. Um, but it, it is about working, and it is about working across local different departments within a local authority with whoever is responsible for running the schools, whether that's a leisure trust, whether that's a different operator, um, and understanding what the community needs are as well to understand when is it useful to have that facility open. Certainly it's not necessarily always useful to, even during school holidays, to have that facility open during the day, for instance. Um, when the school would potentially be available, but potentially there isn't a demand from, say, local sports clubs for access. I like that question, Alison. We have hospital wards closing and airlines being grounded because they can't manage holidays and you're expecting janitors to be sorted. <laughs> <laughs> the naivety of it. Um, in the um, evidence, uh, Alison, your evidence, um, there's a mention about um, the school estate being managed well in your area for access that in any great detail because it's not an area I know so much about okay. but I am conscious that when we have had several new schools built and the arrangements have been much more flexible so it's been factored into that to encourage much more community use of the range of facilities okay um, so I think that's probably about, you know, something going forward is more possible yeah yeah uh, Brian to, to, just to follow, follow on from that uh, convener if we if we take that that question back a level um just wonder if, if, if there's an agreement from uh, around the table that uh, in tackling health inequalities, the most likely place uh, to start would be at school, um, because we have a captive audience there. I wonder if that, that's something we would agree with, and that uh, in, if we're going to invest in tackling health inequalities, that would be the obvious place to start. And then the impact then of the withdrawing of funds for free swimming lessons, compulsory free swimming lessons, because presumably you would agree that to be able to participate in swimming, you'd have to be able to swim. And of course, now there's, we know that there's about 40% of kids go to secondary school that are able to swim. So, my question then is that this, the, again, back to the school estate, uh, if we're going to tackle health inequalities, is that the place we should start? Yeah. Um, I think just to be aware of some of the limitations of that in a rural area, because um, whilst there are lots of opportunities in schools to improve health and to reduce inequalities. I think we also need to think about the family context and the community context as well. So in Scottish borders, if children were given more access to swimming lessons, not all of them have ready access at the weekends or outside of school to swimming pool facilities just because of the, the nature of the geography and the accessibility of those um, types of facilities. So for me, I, I think the approach should be very much more about um, emphasising the importance of physical activity for all members of the community at all ages and stages and not only on, on uh, children because I, th I think the family is a, a huge enabler of that and helps set some of the patterns. School can have an impact but unless we've also got parents very directly engaged in that and indeed um, the extended family, grandparents also, then it, it may be quite limited and also we do then seem to be writing off quite a large proportion of the population who are no longer accessible to in schools and whose health could be improved significantly within their lifetime if we, if we do some other things, often quite simple things. Anyone else? Yeah. 
Welcome. Just very briefly to say, obviously, in curricular school activity isn't something, a sports activity isn't a responsibility of Sports Scotland. And I think that takes me back to the point I made earlier, which is this has to be about all partners pulling together. And um, that is, a, is something you'd have to take up with Education Scotland and with um, local authorities. And that's where we need to see this importance across all different bits of the public sector, getting around the table and discussing how to increase physical activity and to increase sport, um, some of which happened at the National Strategic Group uh, under, underneath the um, Active Scotland Outcomes Framework. But um, it, again, I think when you're looking in terms of this inquiry and at the evidence you take and at the decisions you make and the recommendations you make, it's that understanding that sport is a pretty complex landscape with a huge number of different partners involved in different aspects of it. Okay. Colin? Thanks very much, Kim. I just want to come back on the health inequalities issue. Alison obviously raised it um, earlier um, in one of our answers. Can I ask the panel, do they come across inequalities in the work you do? If, for example, is there, do you see there's lower participation levels amongst whether it's volunteers or, or rehab or, or particular sporting activities from people from more deprived areas? Um, what have you done to try to tackle um, those inequalities? And do you actually even measure those inequalities? Do you know, for example, how many people who come to your activities um, are from the most deprived areas? Is that something you actually measure? Um, you know, is participation simply about the number of people overall, or are you actually measuring where those people are coming from? Yeah. I mean, in terms of social enterprises that are rooted in the community, um, I, I don't think they'll gather a lot of stats, but uh, it's more anecdotal, I'm afraid, and a lot of people are looking for things like social impact, which is a, a, a different dimension, I suppose, but um, the, the most social enterprises are about working with deprived people in communities, and sometimes it's because there's a lack of activity in that particular community, there could be an affordability issue, um, so certainly for social enterprises it is about addressing inequalities and making sure they have access to the physical activity. Anyone else want to come in on that point in relation to it? Yep, Alison. And certainly one of the main barriers that we've identified in asking communities what is it that gets in the way of them being more active tends to be cost um, and often your know, small costs can accumulate when you have a, more, more than one child or there's a bus fare involved as well as the entry fee to, to a facility. So I think it's important not to underestimate that although we, even with some subsidy of costs, it, it can still place an enormous barrier in the way of um, participation in, in things. Um, and for that reason, it, I think it's interesting to look at how import, important and um, the growing interest in walking uh, as a social activity. And we've talked a bit about jogging and Jog Scotland and some other sports, but I think the um, Pass for All initiative programme has been sig really significant in engaging people from a whole range of different types of backgrounds in walking and making use of the environment around them, whether that's in a city or a rural setting. And certainly in the, in the borders, we've got at least 70 volunteers who are supported by, by one part-time um, coordinator. And that has very strong profile in the borders and it has a lot of engagement with um, a wide range of groups, including people with dementia increasingly. Um, so we find it hard though to, to um, gather the, the type of statistics that would help you evidence from which particular um, postcode areas those individuals are coming from because people don't necessarily want to be monitored when they come on something which is seen as being about enjoyment and pleasure and, and being active. Um, and similarly with our Sports and Leisure Trust, I think they also have, our trusts, they also have difficulty in um, gathering information in the format that would be helpful from, from a public health point of view to be able to look at those health inequalities. But the evidence does um, show that we know that that's where the greatest inequalities are likely to, to be. And we do know if within a local um, area, which of the communities are most affected by uh, inequalities and, and low activity. So we can put the different sources of information together, but we're not always able to say that those particular users are, are the ones coming from those particular communities. Colin, Colin mentioned volunteering you, and is there a, are there barriers there in relation to people coming forward from deprived communities to volunteer, or the number of people who are available to assist in setting up organisations? That's not really my area of expertise, I'm afraid. So I, I work within the disclosure service side of things. So there is work that we are doing, we take from the, 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 the PVG data, if you like, that we get through. Yeah. And that's something that we are looking at and as a wider organisation at the minute. But I've, I, I can't give you any detail okay. on that, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Malcolm. Um, I think 
I'd, I'd agree with Alison. It depends on the programme, how appropriate it is to ask different levels of information from participants. Um, if you walk through the door of a community sports club, if you're inactive, the first thing you want to do is not be asked a whole range of monitoring questions. Um, but it is interesting, so for instance, active schools, um, what we did was we looked at the schools that are have the most pupils coming from the lowest 20% of SIMD areas, and what we found was participation in active schools is 11% higher in those schools than in the in nationally, schools overall, which one possible reason for that is that the majority of active schools activity is free, um, so is um, potentially appropriate, whereas in other areas more um, young people might be going to paid um, activity outside of the school environment so there is work going on um, in some of our other programs like community sports hubs there are lots of great examples of individual programs looking at um, providing activity particularly for those who can't afford activity normally so an example here in Edinburgh at the Jack Kane Centre where holiday programs were provided for free but not only were they provided for free but meals were provided to tackle the kind of holiday hunger those at risk of holiday hunger so there's great work going on there at local levels but that's in terms of monitoring, is we, we wouldn't have that data at national set for that particular programme, but where we can gather it and where we are gathering it, certainly with, with a programme like Active Schools, we're seeing um, that the way we are delivering Active Schools is working in those communities. Okay, Marie. Thank you, convener, and thank you, panel. Um, I couldn't let the morning go by without mentioning that it's Women and Girls in Sport Week this week, um, and we've seen... Uh, a huge rise in participation in certain sports in Scotland. So we've seen um, karate and dodgeball quadruple in terms of the level of participation and cross-country tennis and rugby union double in terms of the level of participation in the next five years, in the last five years. So does anyone around the table have any ideas on how they've achieved that and how that might be transferable to other sports? And, and I think, I have to say, Brian, I do think that women, getting women active will have a massive impact <coughs> on, on uh, the whole family's activity level and society's activity level. Anyone wish to comment on that? Welcome, please. So, yeah, I, I think so. those particular stats relate to the active schools programme and participation in those sports within active schools. Um, and again, we've done a huge amount of work um, through a programme called Active Girls that worked with every um, secondary school PE um, department, for instance, to get a better understanding and take a really um, participatory approach to planning um, girls' activity. Um, also looking at who is coaching those sessions and getting more uh, young women and involved in coaching helps to drive up the um, number of uh, women and young girls, particularly, that then see the role models that they can then take after and can approach. I mean, as I said, the, so the latest health survey stats do definitely show that closing gap amongst children, particularly girls versus boys, in terms of the level of those meeting the physical activity standards, which is great to see. Um, and then within the kind of club sector and the governing body sector, we're seeing a lot of sports that have been traditionally seen as male dominated um, and where that potentially a decade ago wouldn't have been seen as a problem, that governing bodies are really focusing on that. And through we, we run something called the Equality Standard for Sport, which it means every sport takes a look through all its policies, all its procedures, all its culture, and says which are the groups that are underrepresented in our sport and why. And again, that taking that approach really not just for gender, but for disability, for socioeconomic inclusion, for age, is an approach that we think we're now seeing a lot of sports develop um, activity in a way that suits the audiences that current, weren't previously attending their classes or their clubs. Catherine, do you want um, I think it's crucially important to be able to identify better where the gaps are and how we can best support people who are less likely to participate in physical activity or sport and tackle that as early as possible, whether that's from the point of perhaps NHS care for the people that we support um, or where uh, people are visiting perhaps their GP with health-related issues. Okay, Alex. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question speaks to your question about volunteering. Um, Brian Wilson was absolutely right when he says that we have a captive audience in schools and in classrooms, but not every young person is adequately engaged in schools and classrooms. And actually, um, you know, I speak from my perspective both as a, a youth worker, volunteer youth worker of many years, and chair of the cross-party group 
of uh, volunteering that over the last decade or so we've seen a slow decline in youth work in this country in, particularly around the closure of the community education department at Strathclyde University but also in the erosion of local authority budgets behind both detached and sessional youth work in my experience it is detached and sessional youth work which leads the hardest to reach young people to sport in the first place and I would like the views of the panel as to whether that's a rather bleak assessment or whether there are examples of best practice where youth work is flourishing in this country. Alison. I can only speak for Scottish Borders, but I think we have got um, a vibrant youth work sector in the Borders. We have uh, a youth borders organisation which acts as an umbrella to um, work with the network of more local uh, youth work groups who are in close partnership with our community learning and development service within the council. So that all is under the umbrella of our, our community learning and development strategic partnership. And I, and I think we've just been through an inspection which has spoken quite highly of some of the examples of good practice that they've seen there. Physical activity is one of the range of opportunities and, and skill sets that we would um, hope to offer to young people, not just for the benefit of their health, but for a whole range of other positive outcomes. And is the budget there going up or down? Um, I, I couldn't comment. I would be surprised if it's going up, but I don't think it's going down drastically. <laughs> I would be extremely surprised. <coughs> you could maybe let us know that. Mm, yes. yes. Anyone else like to come up? Yeah, Ken. Um, one of the, the indicators that's set for us by Sports Scotland is to encourage more people, young people to be involved in, in sport. We have taken it slightly wider than that, and it's not because not everybody takes part in sport or wants to take part in sport. But we need councils to be able to run these sports. We need member clubs to be able to run as well. And we actively encourage young people with different skills, whether it be social media, journalism or whatever, to become part of these councils, to know how it is to, to run schools, uh, sports councils. In fact, we're now in a position where we have young people involved in, more than, in 12 of our local sports councils doing great work um, for the people. The trouble is that if, if you look at sports councils as they are at the moment, the average age, because it's nearly all volunteers that's doing it, will be 60 plus. And it's great to have that different view from them, 18 to 25 year olds is, is the main age that we're looking at, who bring a different perspective on, on how sport needs to be run, what needs to be done with sport in, in, the, in the, the areas that they're. So we actively encourage people to become involved in that side of things. Yep. Anyone else like to come in? Yeah, no. Just briefly, um, again, not well positioned to comment on funding for youth services within local authorities, but I think where what we used to see in the past was a real distinction made between youth work on the one hand and sport on the other. And I think what we're seeing much more is an understanding that sports coaches can be youth workers and that youth workers deliver sport and that we shouldn't necessarily draw a distinction between them. At a strategic level, what that means is that we work with... Um, Youth Scotland, but we're then seeing examples. So Scottish Rowing are delivering a program in the Firhill Basin on the canal in Glasgow, which is um, looking at engaging young people who are disengaged with education and with sport, and taking a youth youth work led approach to how how that program runs. Thanks for that. My experience of youth work is that. Um, you can reach the hardest to reach young people by establishing positive relationships. That's Relationships are at the heart of youth work. And irrespective of what the activity is that's being undertaken, it is that the relationship that germinates that interest, that engagement, that um, staying power that young people who perhaps have never had any of those things um, can, can commit to. And I think, you know, it, it's important. I'm glad to hear that that distinction has now been blurred because it was perhaps a barrier if you felt that, you know, sports coaches were the sole arbiters and sole um, deliverers of sporting education, whereas actually you've got some amazing detached youth work going on there, starting street football, street hockey, late night boxing, um, which introduced young people to sport who would never have had the courage or the social inclusion to come and join a club or, or try out for a team. Uh, that was a statement, not a comment. Yeah, a question. Thank you. <laughs> you could also say, am I correct? Yes, am I correct? Sure. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> 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 uh, um, uh, the volunteers, if we could, if we could tie now the volunteers <coughs> into perhaps Commonwealth Games legacy and how much of the uh, uh, Commonwealth Games legacy was linked to uh, raising the, the, the number of volunteers because at the end of the day, if you're going to raise the number of participants, you have to raise the number of of volunteers and, and 
I'm thinking specifically about a program that worked particularly well, which was the um, Club Together program. Uh, and for the benefit of the, the panel, that was basically um, putting in a part-time, I think 15 hours a week, um, the, the paid-for position within clubs that was funded partly by, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, Malcolm, I think it was Sports Scotland, the club themselves, and privately funded. And it was about £7,500 a year. Um, and that has, again, correct me if I'm wrong, increased by about 400 volunteers in, uh, into the sector and about 3,000 athletes. So the question is around the link between the volunteers, uh, increasing volunteers, and was that part of the Commonwealth Games legacy and, uh, and perhaps that, that impact? Whoever? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the Club Together, certainly Scottish Athletics, who ran the Club Together programme, it was a very successful programme. Um, it looked at building the capacity of clubs, um, and part of that was about the fact that if you're going to grow the club, you need the people to be the, running the club, whether those be coaches or the administrators or the safeguarding officers or the treasurer or whoever it is. Um, to be able to increase that capacity and deliver extra sessions and um, do the fundraising required to support all of that. Um, and that that was a very conscious approach that Scottish Athletics took ahead of the Commonwealth Games to say, if there is going to be a legacy, we need to have the capacity um, to take in the new participants. And they've seen good growth across um, a lot of athletics, athletics clubs across Scotland. Um, and yet yeah, the the question around um, more widely around volunteers and the legacy of the games certainly for instance active schools we've seen a 50% um, increase in the number of volunteers in the last five years I think the ability to link that directly to the Commonwealth Games is always a bit of a attribution question so um, we certainly would say that the I think Scottish Athletics used, used the phrase, legacy is what we do every day. It's about all the different bits of sport that are built into increasing the numbers of people coming through the door at sports clubs across the country um, and making sure that the infrastructure is in place to deliver that. I think my, my question, though, is that um, 2012 was similar to this. It was all about increasing the number of participants. I'm just asking the question, in increasing the number of, in, with the target of increasing the number of people participating in activity, was the need for volunteers uh, properly taken into account? And I, I think the answer to that, I would say, is yes. Um, I mean, it was something, as you, you gave a great example of a sport that took that approach, and I know that's not an isolated example of sports that took that approach. A large number of sports understood that if they were going to increase um, the number of people playing their sport, that what they needed was more volunteers. And as I said, we're um, actively qualifying a huge number of um volunteer coaches every single year um, so I think if you if you're going to support sport to grow you need to support the volunteering arm of it and we do that certainly in a number of ways both through those coaching subsidies through providing training to clubs to ensure they understand how to manage volunteers because I think that's an important element and I'm sure Volunteer Scotland might have more to say on that but around it's not good enough just to have a volunteer walk through the door and then leave them to it. Um, you need to have a club ethos that um, understands how how to support a volunteer once they're in place. Yeah, Catherine, then, Claire. Um, just on strike, Scotland obviously don't have sporting volunteers specifically, but um, just to, to make the point that recruiting and retaining volunteers is a challenge to all organisations across various sectors. We're one of the biggest volunteering organisations with a workforce of around 1,600 people. Um, but even then, we have to um, re-recruit about another 400 people every year because of the, the massive turnover. We've invested hugely in supporting, um, providing training for our volunteers. But key for us has been in identifying the motivation for volunteering in the first place and then playing to that as a strength very much. So if people are looking for particular skills and experience, then we try and give that to them. We're working at the moment with Queen Margaret University. They've got a new degree course on physical activity and well-being. And we're going to be working with some of their second and third year students to provide them with volunteer <coughs> placements where they can help some of our service users to be physically active and participate um, in community-based activities. Okay, Claire. Thank you, convener. The panel will be aware that um, the committee have uh, looked at uh, uh, the PVG scheme um, in relation to sports and sports coaching, <coughs> in particular uh, youth football. 
Um, and I wanted to ask you and McMartin about that and whether the, the PVG scheme as it currently stands has had any impact on volunteering um, or how a Volunteer Scotland view that. Okay, if we look at the, so if we look at the, the, the numbers of our, we have somewhere in the region is 266 sporting organisations that access free checks, PVG checks through ourselves. That's including the the, um, the governing bodies. So you've got the clubs that obviously feed into the governing bodies. So we've got somewhere in the region of 266 sporting organisations alone. Um, but what is clear in the last year, certainly since January this this year up to September, we have seen a marked increase, up to 200% increase in the number of applications for PVG. So it, clubs are known that know that they have to do it. Clubs are aware that they have to do it, and the volunteers are aware that they have to go through the process, and they're more than happy to do it. Um, some of the organisations, if we could look at, the, obviously SYFA had a huge increase um, given the, the situation they were felt found themselves in last year. But the SRU and themselves are, are over 400% increase in applications <coughs> for PBG in, in the same period compared to last year, January to, to September. So, so what do your, your organisation put down the increase in PBG forms to? I think there's the basis of... Uh, the media coverage and what's ha actually had to happen and what uh, organisations should be doing and what a regulated role actually is. So, sorry, are you suggesting that perhaps there were sports groups that didn't know that they had I think that we are certainly working with a lot of sports or sport organisations to actually help them understand what they should and shouldn't be looking to PVG check. Okay, and are you monitoring exactly who it is that's putting in these yeah, applications? Yeah, well, we, we, we regularly keep them and I can provide the, the, the numbers to, to the panel and there's no problem with that. Um, it actually shows you where the, the number... The, the applications are coming through. I think that um, convener would be very helpful because you've raised a bit of a concern with me now <laughs> that, that perhaps there were organisations that weren't complying Absolutely. with PVG. Disclosure. I think there was a lack of understanding. Certainly there was a lack of understanding has become apparent. So if there's a lack of understanding, who, who's responsible for ensuring that sporting groups and clubs do have an understanding? Well, of they've got the, the understanding is, is the, the, their responsibility, but we're, our organisation's here to support, as is Disclosure Scotland. But I, can, I can provide the detail to let you, to, to let you see where the I'd numbers are. I'd be very keen to, yeah. to have a look at those. Yes, thanks. Could I, uh, you, you said that you've had overall 200% increase in PVG applications. Yeah. And from the SRU, you've had a what increase? 400%? Yes, sir, you, it's, it's in the region of 400%. Yeah. There, has, there hasn't been, I would contend, a 400% increase in participants. No, I wouldn't have think so. I wouldn't have thought so. Um, and are you seeing similar increases across other sports? There's some other sports, yeah. There's large increases. I think it's, a bit, it's an awareness now. It's becoming more apparent, and, and organisations are trying to get their house in order. So if they are registering people for PG, PVG who weren't previously registered then and they are doing that properly with your guidance registering the right people yeah. therefore people who have no need to be PVG checked are not being PVG yeah, correct, checked yeah. we can only contend that there was a large number of people who should have been who aren't, who weren't potentially yeah that is very concerning um, I think we need to get much more information from yourselves yeah. about that as to where these applications are coming from, where the big increases are, and why those organisations were unaware that they had to PVG check people who are presumably taking part in regulated activity. Yeah, that would be the case. But it's certainly the numbers, I can provide the numbers, not a problem. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Convener. Can I just ask then, given the information that you've given us just now, Mr McMartin, um, how many of those PVG checks were not passed? How many people... I don't have a number in front of me. I, I think that would be a really important piece of information for the, the committee to have quite quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you who... Um, no, I'm not asking for individual names. I'm asking no. for numbers right, okay. yeah. under each organisation. Could I say I'm somewhat surprised that we are finding this information out in this way... Uh, and I think the committee really needs to follow up on that and why that information has not been volunteered uh, by Disclosure Scotland or uh, or whoever. This is only, this information is only like when we've picked up on um, and, and basically dissected the data that we've we've had in this year. But <coughs> had Clare Hockey 
not introduce that line of question, then we wouldn't have known. And that information was it the intention of Disclosure Scotland to write to the committee? Or well, I would have certainly. I would certainly. My intention to pass it on. Okay, we will most certainly be writing and uh, seeking that information. Anybody else want to raise any final issues? No. Okay, can I thank you all very much for your attendance this morning, and we'll suspend briefly for a change of panel.
The uh, second item on the agenda is the first evidence session on technology and innovations in health and social care. Um, we've got a number of guests this morning, and like the previous panel, I'll introduce myself, and then we'll go around the table, and you can introduce yourself. Uh, Neil Finlay, uh, Labour MSP for the Lothian, and I'm the chair of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, good morning, I'm Claire Hockey, I'm the MSP for Rutherglen and the Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Pro Professor Patricia Connolly, Strathclyde University, I'm the Director of the Strathclyde Institute of Medical Devices. Tom Offer, MSP for Renfrewshire South. Hi, I'm John Brown, the Director of Policy for the Scottish Life Sciences Association. <coughs> it's a trade body representing 140 companies in Scotland that do life sciences, including e-health. Hello, I'm Andy Robertson. I'm the Director of IT at NHS National Services Scotland. Uh, we run most of the, the big national systems that, that support the health service in Scotland. Good morning, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Western. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Elaine Gemmell, Head of Project Development at Scottish Health Innovations, working with the NHS to help um, commercialise innovation within the health service. Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. <coughs> Zahid Dean, Digital Health and Care Strategic Lead at the Alliance. Uh, good morning, uh, Brian Whittle, um, MSP South of Scotland. Good morning, I'm Christoph Tümmler, I'm a consultant physician, a GP and I'm Professor of eHealth at Edinburgh Napier University. Marie Todd, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Good morning, my name is Alex Matthews, I work for PA Consulting where I lead our um, digital work in health and social care in Scotland. I'm uh, Colin Smith, MSP for the South of Scotland. Okay, sorry, uh, it was remiss me. Before we begin, uh, uh, I should have said that um, we may have some declarations of interest from members, and I would like to declare an interest myself in that our close relative is a, uh, works for a, a company involved in uh, e-technology. Anyone else? Brian? I declare the um, director of a um, technology company creating collaboration and communication platforms uh, for organisations, including healthcare, uh, although I don't take any remuneration anymore and have very little uh, working with that company just now. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, anyone like to ask the opening question? And my colleagues? Okay, Brian, yeah? Oh, I, I just, just a, a very general question and asking the question, how easy is it for um, new technology to make its way into uh, working practice in the NHS? Okay, who would like to begin? Yes, Patricia. So I think there are several routes in. In Scotland, there is the SLA and their help with the Health Improvement Scotland. There is through the universities. If you're a knowledgeable small company, you can get in with technology or a very large company and you can find the right clinical connections and the academic groups can do that. The problem goes, I think, Beyond that, as soon as these technologies start to get proved or CE marked, i.e. ready for market, then the barriers to uptake are then very, very high. So I think we're quite good at setting up the initial research programmes and I think we're very bad at implementing our own technology in, in the country. Hey, Alex? So I, I just want to say that um, under certain circumstances it can be into the NHS in Scotland. Um, we've got some direct evidence of having worked with uh, NHS Education for Scotland to do just that, where we implemented a live system to um, help manage education and training of um, training doctors in, in just four months. So um, the answer is, or my answer is, that, that it's incredibly easy to do. Um, it just needs the right conditions to be put around it. Uh, Christoph? Yeah. I'm a little bit surprised, I mean, uh, about this answer. I mean, my experience from years and years in the NHS is actually that it is more like Patricia was already saying, it is not really that easy. And uh, the more complex the technology, the more complex it's going to be, because simply due to the structure of the NHS. So that means, in my opinion, what is lacking is some kind of comprehensive policy approach. So what we have in the moment in Scotland I would think we need to talk about that and we need to be uh, more detailed in our planning and what we want because technology is moving forward so rapidly. And while I appreciate that you might have been talking about certain specific technologies that indeed could have been managed in four months' time, 
key technologies that are relevant for tagging, for tracking, for managing patients, for managing pharmaceuticals and stuff. And we, we don't have the right technologies and we, are, we have a very difficult process in the moment to trial these things and implement them, which has also economical implications. John? Five years ago now, the Health Innovation Partnership. In fact, it was Ms Sturgeon who launched it when she was CABSEC for Health. And my organisation was given the job of delivering that. And in that time, we've partnered about 180 companies with over 1,000 clinicians. Now, these clinicians would be the early adopters. They kind of self-selected themselves. But the outcomes of that are now starting to come through to the procurement level. And <clears throat> I'll not say it's easy. I agree with the remarks that Christoph has made. But there is a mechanism to help. But where we find one of the barriers after that is that even when the NHS may buy the new device, and we've got some specific examples of this, um, NHS procurement in one case bought 30,000 uh, devices which were better in terms of patient outcome and cheaper than the existing products. And then silence. They're in the warehouse in Lanarkshire. And to get the information across, we call that issue, Chairman, adoption and spread. Mm -hmm. You can do all the research and prove that it works and have a bunch of eager clinicians, but unless you do adoption and spread across the board, the result can be a bit of a damp squib. So who, if they're still lying there, if they're still lying in a warehouse, who's held accountable for that? Sorry, who's held accountable for that? What self well, we're talking to is a um, huge waste of public money. Yeah, <clears throat> we're talking to. They are not um, complex devices. They're basically what are they? They are drain tubes for surgery with a new, a novel way of adjustment. Instead of stitching them into the patient's body, there's a very clever way of doing that without. So why are they sitting in a warehouse? Uh, information not being available. Um, the fact that people have always used the old ones. The fact that the suppliers of the old ones are quite keen not to have their market taken away and they have... So who's accountable for that? We've had a meeting with the NHS Director of Strategic Sourcing. So is he accountable? And he's very interested in that. No, 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 no about being interested. Is he the person who commissioned that contract and therefore is accountable for that decision being made? Or is it someone else? Well, I don't work for the NHS, but from my no, but view, I think the answer them. to your question is yes. Thank you. OK, Tom. What kind of sums of money are we talking about? Well, in this, in the example I'm using, these things cost pennies. Well, maybe a one pound fifty or something. It's a it's a piece of low tech but very very useful innovation, and it's patented. And the the NHS were very good at saying, right, we'll buy thirty thousand of these. But then adoption and spread is the issue. How do you get the information out? Whatever it is. It's maybe a simple piece of plastic or it might be a complex e-health system. And is that one example that you've given repeated in many other areas? Yes, I could give you other examples. OK, well, can you write to us with, with more examples of that? <coughs> sorry, Tom. The sorry, issue Tom. of cost, what in terms of um, uh, the clinical application, said this is a normal method, uh, how is this impacting upon patient outcomes? Presumably, patients are losing out. Indeed, we've got evidence from the NHS. The NHS has a, an assessment organisation called the Scottish Health Technology Group, and it assessed this device and wrote a positive report. It was cost-effective, the patient outcomes were better, and they recommended it for NHS procurement. We were delighted with that and thought, that's it. But... OK. Um, Elaine, you wanted to come in on this, and then I'm going to come to you, Ivan. There's a number of people wanting in this, so I'm coming to you. So I come at this from a slightly different viewpoint in that I stand beside the NHS and we look at the innovation that happens within there. So what we're doing is looking at innovation that actually originates within the NHS and looking at a way for that then to be rolled out on a much wider basis. Um, I think what we find is the willingness to innovate and the facilities to make that happen are very, very good within the NHS. 
and we can go and we can work with companies and we can bring all the expertise to bear. I think we're, um, and perhaps John alluded to this, um, once there's a, a product available that's looking to be rolled out on a wider basis, I think at that point um, it becomes more difficult because there's certainly an area where the dissemination of success isn't rolled out as well as it could be. The sharing practices aren't rolled out quite as, as well as they could be. And um, I think if this was attacked at perhaps at a more national level rather than a geographic level, it might open up some of those barriers. Okay, um, I have a few people coming that want to come in, um, Alec and Ivan and Marie. And Marie, is it on this issue? Because you indicated very early, is it on this issue? Yeah, it's yeah really that's fine. Yeah, I'll take you first, Marie, then. It, it's really just um, a comment. So we don't often, as politicians, hear a plea for um, something to be centralised. But that was a common theme throughout the evidence that was given, was that the variation at health board level was causing a, a challenge um, on the ground and that actually centralising commissioning and distribution uh, would be um, a good thing. <laughs> That's a real challenge for us as politicians. <laughs> so I just wondered if you would like to have a comment on that. I think within the community there is a, a very real appreciation that there are lots of people that can play a very important role in this. Um, I think that if there has been any criticism levied in this particular environment, it is that um, there is some confusion over the roles that each of the organisations play. I think each of them have a very important role to play and I think what we would look for is some kind of coordinated effort to define roles and responsibilities and to facilitate the organisations coming together and working in a, a complementary way. OK. Uh, Patricia? Yeah, I think when you talk about centralising, many people envisage you know, committees and large structures in the centre. I think the problem of um, the centralisation, or at least making some sort of similarity across the NHS, really goes to the frontline staff. Many of us will have um, experience in devices for the community, devices for home or patient monitoring. And there tends to be an enthusiasm from certain groups who can see the cost savings or the time savings. There tends to be what we call pilotitis. Everybody wants to pilot a little bit of, of something. And then I have to say you tend to find real kickback from the frontline clinical people, partially because I think digital medicine and e-health and personal monitoring is very challenging. It challenges both the clinician and the patient, and it monitors both the clinician and the patient. And so without a mandate to do things, what happens is a community group may try something, and several, say, nurses in the group don't want to use it. It never gets adopted because there's no uniformity. And it's very difficult for them to get the business change mechanism. Because, for example, I've got a device that saves time in wound care, but Unless you're on electronic nurse management and you're managing your day saying, I don't need to see that patient, the results say these are okay, or it's diabetes or blood pressure, then it's very hard in the current system, paper-based and take your bag out for the day to make the changes. So this, these are some fundamental changes about what digital technology is doing to us in terms of, of di everything from diary management to who picks up the result and, and who monitors and what's, what's happening. So it's centralisation, but... And, and similarity, but in a different kind of way. More pilots than Ryanair, would you say? Well, maybe everybody has his thing. Elaine, did you want to come back in? Yes, I think it's also very important to make sure that um, you're, you're looking at the requirements and that what is implemented is implemented across the board. It's very easy to implement something that would only be suitable at a very small geographic area. Um, if you then open that up to, to a much wider area and it's managed in a coherent way, you can make sure that the solutions that are put in place are actually solutions that will be suitable across the board rather than just in small niche areas. Okay, Andy, did you want to come in here? Yeah, um, as, as an organisation that, that spends a lot of its time doing the, the centralised activities, um, I, I think to, to Alex's point earlier on, there are certain conditions when, when uh, new innovations and new technologies find their way to, to NSS that makes it a lot easier. It's this kind of national level sponsorship uh, and bodies and, and the, the, the connections are made back into to all of the different health boards that would be looking to deploy these types of technology. 
Um, so uh, we've got a, a proposal, I think we put it into the, the submission to, to, the, uh, to the committee uh, in and around a service that might support a, a, a single process and a funnel, if you like, for new technologies to find themselves uh, to the front line and providing the type of support that, uh, that these types of initiatives require. It's been, able to, it's been able to get beyond procurement law, it's been able to get beyond governance, the funding, um, the, the implementation, the support models that come with that, uh, the ongoing funding of the tail. Often there's funding for the initial deployment of a new technology, but we've got to then run that as part of the health service for the next, you know, you need to, to be able to see the next five, ten years worth of funding to support that type of technology. And, and helping the, the boards themselves, uh, who, who daily struggle with just the sheer volume of, of, uh, of demand on them, to implement change as they are uh, doing their day job. So I think there's, there's a role for support from a central point of view. I don't think we're saying central organisations should deliver these new technologies, but certainly a role in supporting the boards. But what you've described appears to be a very cluttered landscape of um, and, and, and numerous hurdles that have to be gotten over before something actually gets to patients. Now, given that we're talking about technology, are we not in a place where much of that will be yesterday's news by the time it goes through that whole torturous process. Well, it, it, it's it's uh, a lot. Of the, a lot of the controls that are in there are in for for fairly good reasons Absolutely. in terms of uh, yeah. value for money, yeah. uh, sponsorship, willingness of boards to deploy. You know, we, we, we've heard an example for John there uh, that there's no point in us going buying new technology if, if there isn't the uh, the willingness of the health boards to deploy that new technology. Um, we can't control that, uh, but we can certainly support it. But those things take time. The, the, the NHS, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, is an extremely complicated organisation. The number of different clinical disciplines there are, the, the 22 health boards, 170,000 employees, 3,500 different locations on the end of our network. Um, it, it's a very complicated organisation. So, so I, I can understand why people would have the impression that there are many hurdles but it's because of that level of complexity and, and the governance structures that sit underneath it that make it so. And could all of that be um, radically streamlined? I think we could. I, I think we, we is could. Is there a willingness to do, or is there evidence that that's happening? Um, I, I think in places. Now, now <coughs> Alec uh, touched on this earlier, and, and uh, I think uh, you know, it, it's probably wrong to, to build the impression that there is nothing. There's nothing new happening in the world <coughs> of technology in the NHS. I think that's uh, extremely unfair. What we're currently working on on, on a number of things on a anybody, number of fronts. I don't think anybody's suggesting. No, that. no, but but, but it's, it's that impression that 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 uh, that, that, that perhaps uh, um, committee members could come away with that there's nothing new making it uh, to, to the front line, and I think that's not true. Um, Christoph, and then I'll come to you, Ivan. Uh, um, I mean, I think one of the biggest problems we have. I understand all you're saying, Andy, but the problem is simply that new technologies evolve. They evolve on a global scale, globalization, and I mean, I understand that the NHS has all of these problems, but these technology developments, they will not wait for the NHS. So we need to find pathways that help us to evolve, to develop these technologies, also for economic reasons, um, in Scotland, and then implement them into the NHS. We cannot take these technologies on grassroots level into the NHS and wait until they evolve on the speed of the NHS, because then it's exactly as you said, it's yesterday's news. This will never work. We've tried that in the past. It never worked, you know. And throwing, you know, 200 pilots at, at clinicians who, who are up to their neck and, and, and high levels of demand and, and with technologies that don't integrate with the current platforms that are there and, and introducing a level of change that, that interferes with operational delivery. So I, I'm not saying that there's no one right and wrong here. It's, it's we need to get that balance right. And, and to perhaps the Neil's point, that there is opportunity for us to look at how do we streamline this and make it more effective than it currently is. I'm not pushing back on that need. OK, Elaine, and then I'm going to bring Marie, then Ivan. I think just when you touched on um, how long it takes to develop these technologies and how quickly they change, I think you also have to look at how long it takes for the regulatory approval process for these um, devices and technologies to be implemented. Um, at this point in time, it takes an inordinate length of time to have an examination of a technical file, for example. So you could have all of the evidence ready to have this 
um, on the market as a smart <coughs> device, and you may wait six to nine months to have a notified body come and do the approval process. Marie? I don't. No, no, okay. Uh, Ivan? Uh, thanks, convener. Um, first, I just wanted to touch back on the, the, the initial interaction with uh, John Brown and yourself around about this um, new devices that are stuck in the warehouse. And the initial reaction, I think this gets to maybe part of the core of the problem, but the initial reaction was, whose fault is it? Who do we blame? Who bought this stuff that nobody's using? Surely the person that bought the stuff is doing the right thing by taking the risk, which is the key part of innovation. Um, the problem isn't there. The problem is the rollout of the stuff and how do we engineer that? And if we go back and blame the person that bought it, then nobody else is going to buy a new ever again. And that means we don't move forward. Right? That mindset is critical, in my experience, to moving the innovation agenda agenda forward. Second point I wanted to make, and people may or may not want to comment on that, but if there are innovative technologies there, and there's an example there that I'm assuming saves money, I'm assuming makes processes better and more efficient, assuming that they can get through their list quicker, I'm assuming it ticks all the boxes that health board managers would want to deliver on. If they're under that pressure and there's no shortage of health board people coming in here and telling us I haven't got enough money, resources to do stuff, there's ideas there or products there that make things more efficient. You think they'd be falling over themselves to adopt this stuff. So there's clearly something missing in that chain of how people see their role as health board managers or directors or their awareness of what's going on or their ability to execute stuff within their, their own boards that means that they're not grabbing this stuff and running with it. Um, and I suppose the last thing I just wanted to throw out there was um, kind of question round about, and it kind of goes to some of the stuff Elaine was talking about perhaps, Innovative ideas, if somebody can maybe map out for me the pathway. If I'm a health service employee working in a ward or whatever and I've got a good idea and that might be not necessarily in its high tech, probably not, just let's reorganise something, let's do something a wee bit differently instead of doing the process, uh, reorganise the way things are laid out here or, or change something in terms of information flow or anything. How did I get that good idea through this process, who do I talk to? What do they do with it? Where does it go then? How do we trial it? How does because unless you've got that innovation, that continuous improvement bubbling up from the bottom, and people feel they can have good ideas that are then taken forward, frankly, you're not going to innovate and you're not going to make improvements. You need okay, to you've make. only got forty-three questions to answer on that. <laughs> I've been waiting so. for 15, 20 minutes to get in. <laughs> yes, okay, but everybody's wanting to even that's the, that's the issue. Elaine. Okay, so I, if I could talk about the, the last question first. Um, Scottish Health Innovations was set up specifically to work with the health service to identify innovation that happens in there. We've been in existence since 2002 and when we first started um, we would speak to people and ask them about innovation and they would tell us they didn't innovate, that wasn't their job. Over the years we've managed through evidence to build up a pathway for them to, to get these ideas through. Um, on our board we have um, four of the, the major health boards represented and we work with each of the 14 health boards under a service level agreement. So we have a relationship with each and every one of the, the R&D departments within the health board. So any employee that has a good idea, their first port of call would either be to their own management who would direct them to R&D department or in some instances um, they would come directly to Scottish Health Innovations. What we would then do is we would evaluate that idea to determine if it was something that was useful, um, if it was innovative, if there were other things that perhaps answered the same question, we would point people in that direction. But if it was truly something that should be developed for the you know, better patient care or better way of, sort of doing things, what we then do is we pull together a team of people that can help take that innovation from the first idea right through the whole process. And um, we help both with advice and with resource and eventually with finding partners that will then take it onto the market. Thanks. Choose that you want to directly raise there. No, uh, I'm happy with that. Just okay. been any comments on any of the other stuff that are raised as well. I talked about a thousand clinicians working with two hundred companies. And these are the early adopters, but they are busy clinicians who see the point of the innovation and want it and are happy to work collaboratively. The other people who get it are the top management of the NHS. Paul Gray, the chief executive, has had a career in government IT. He really understands these issues. But <clears throat> I think that um, one of the blocks or the barriers is <clears throat> 
in management support for innovation. Innovation is not on the job description of senior managers in boards. Not yet. And, <clears throat> for example, one thing that needs to be done is that rather than work on the goodwill of these thousand clinicians, who are doing it off the end of a very busy workload, uh, <clears throat> in many places the healthcare system funds a bit of clinician time to work on innovation with collaborators. That's not done yet in Scotland. You have to rely on altruism or some clinicians who are interested in innovation for its own sake and they find it really enjoyable to work with companies to develop new products. But you cannot depend on that to have a system that will pick up innovation and implement it across the board. Anyone else like to come in on that? Christoph? Maybe let me add one thing to that. I mean, we are speaking a lot here about the NHS and uh, what we can do within the NHS and these kind of structures. I think it is very important to also consider um, parallel universes. So, for example, uh, in the moment there's a lot of discussion in information technologies, mobile technologies about new technologies, communication technologies such as 5G. These technologies are the future. On a European level, they are being pushed forward. There will be um, early prototypes in 2020 in America. This is already on the way. Now, these technologies, they will be essential to the way we are going to treat patients over the next decade, over the next 20 years. And I think we need also to talk about this. I think it is good what we're doing in the moment, talking about the NHS, what is working, what is not working, how we get inno innovation out of the NHS. But I think we also need to, to look into the next couple of years, into the future, because otherwise we will be here all a little bit on the back foot. England invests double-digit million figures in this technology we have not a penny available in Scotland in the moment. So we are completely cut off of this. And I think these kind of things, they need to be discussed because uh, you cannot look at health technology as a single standing uh, issue because in the future we will treat more and more patients outside hospitals. This is a fact. And when we do this, there needs to be connectivity between the point of care, which will be shifting out of the NHS into the patient's home, and we need communication technologies to connect in order to deliver the next generation of healthcare. And I think this is very important that we're looking a little bit forward rather than to discuss, you know, what's happened over the last years and how we, where we stand and so on. Okay, hey, Alex. To the panel. Um, I'm very interested in how decisions are made in adopting tech within the health service. Alison Johnson and I, over the summer recess, attended a fascinating visit to the Cancer Research Centre at the Western General in Edinburgh. Um, and there was a, a guy there testing drugs, and he had a new machine which is effectively just a look like a fish tank and it cost a quarter of a million pounds, but it allowed him to do his job 67 times faster than he used to do it before in terms of the number of drugs he could test in any one day, uh, which is fascinating. And, and I, I suppose it led to a question to me um, as to what, what's the parameters that are put around decision-making like that? What's the fulcrum over which a decision is taken to invest in this tech and this innovation um, against it not being cost-effective? And I'm conscious that we don't operate in a vacuum here. We've got tech companies who are lobbying clinicians and decision-makers to choose their, uh, their brand and their machine and, and extolling the virtues of their machine. But can I have some views from the panel as to how those decisions are currently taken, what are the parameters that are used to decide it, and how, are we getting it right? Patricia, did you, you wanted to come in earlier. Can you come in and also raise your earlier point? Right, OK. So um, I wanted to follow on from, from Christoph, actually, and, and say we have to be very cognizant of what's going on elsewhere. If we think that, you know, Apple now have a complete med tech division, uh, they're promising glucose sensors on, on their watches, etc. And so there are developments coming commercially that patients want to access and we're, are going to push us very, very hard. And I'm, I know that Justine Ewing mentioned Push Doctor in her submission. And I, if you look at even that, Push Doctor for £20 on your phone, you get a face-to-face -face consultation with a qualified GP and a prescription if you need it. And then I read every weekend about the locum problems all over Scotland and the millions and millions of pounds that are being spent on locums. And I wonder 
Why can we not take some subscription for patients through NHS 24 to push doctor? It would probably get rid of much of the actual go and see patient problems. Now, these are commercial developments, and I know it's a bit taboo. We're rightly very proud of our NHS, but we have to look at where companies have developed the right solution and not, not do it from scratch. Much of the home monitoring will come on to that as well. I think on, on that side, the other thing we're falling behind in is our innovation pipeline. We are not funding our devices and our med tech development in Scotland as we should be. And I work with people in Hong Kong, Singapore, around the world uh, in, in the US who are building up large wealth packages because they're developing companies and, and, and research projects together. And it really has um, fallen behind here. I, I think on the decision making, to come back to the members' um, questions, I, I think at some levels, if it's a very large piece of equipment like a surgical robot, then you can make uh, application to the health boards and they have to have very good cost um, savings arguments. If you're a big company, you can maybe do that. And I know maybe worth talking to people like Medtronic, et cetera, on that. On the more day-to-day -day stuff for the SMEs, it's whether you have a clinical opinion leader and whether you can push through the clinical barriers, the natural resistance that people have to changing their way of working. And if you imagine a big organisation trying to roll out, I don't know, a piece of HR software, in the NHS, everybody gets to try that software and say, well, I don't like it. You know, I'm not using it in my job. So and we have this situation where we have a very complex clinical management need, but we also have everybody empowered to say ye or nay to new things that are coming on the technological side. And I think that becomes very, very difficult. And it's, it is a natural human thing. And, and I understand the, the pushback on it. Um, Alison, is it on this point? No. No, oh, OK. Is Zahid? Is Zahid? Yeah, in terms of innovations that come from elsewhere, I think we have to recognise that the mm -hmm. third sector is a major innovator in both digital health and care. And there's few examples, if any, of them working with or connecting into the NHS and social care. And part of that is because I don't think it's really seen as a partner. It's seen as a safety net. Whereas actually it's a provider of a third of social care services, does a huge amount in terms of clinical research. And a way to address that would be to give it a seat at the table, and that includes on decision making. It needs to be considered as part of the fold and not something that is an afterthought. Okay. Um, Andy, did you want to? Um, I think that the answer to the question um, is it's highly situational, and it kind of depends on the technology, it depends on uh, the linkage into the, uh, into the uh, cl clinical community. Um, normally, if there's a new piece of technology, it will be picked up by, by the clinicians. And uh, if there is a, a national level organisation that sits round about that, then you've got a, a better than average chance. But the, the governance essentially sits board by board in terms of the adoption of new technologies. Uh, that's the default position. Uh, if anything is decided to go national, there is a, 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 there'll be a, a, a a layer of national level governance will be put in place to oversee the deployment into, into board by board. But once it's made it through that threshold, but you need, you need that initial threshold essentially to be picked up by the people who are willing to sponsor it through the health service, push it to become a national level programme, and then uh, we, I would say we, things become a, a bit more straightforward at that stage. There's a rough guide to lobbying in the NHS about how to get your product through the system. Sure there it? is. No, no, that, you just gave us it there. <laughs> um, uh, Alex? I just want to add to um, uh, Alex's question. Um, whilst I'm not going to comment on the process of decision making, I think one of the complexities that needs to be recognised is that in saving um, clinician time, for example, um, uh, quite quite often that's you know that's very easy to identify and very easy to recognise. But actually, translating uh, saved clinician time into an actual cost saving is very very complicated to do. So I think um, at, at the heart of the issue is is the ability um, to take uh, that kind of clinician time saving and be able to translate that into um, a, a better balance of health and social care that actually achieves a shift away from. Um, hospital or residential or locality-based care in, into people's homes um, uh, and for, for people to take more respons responsibility for their own for their own health care and start to um, kind of self-treat, self-diagnose um, and uh, engage a little bit more in, in the way that they, they look after the care themselves. Alex? Thank you, convener. Yes, I'm grateful for that. Um, members of this committee, the MSPs around the table, um, are all too aware 
of the efforts that pharma companies go through to try and lobby us in terms of trying to exert such influence as we have um, on the government in terms of its dealings with SMC and getting licensing for drugs. Tech in the health service is commodity based as well. It's about selling goods to the health service. So I wonder, um, and, and in fact, the convener of this committee took a bill through Parliament last year that's going to tighten up lobbying of parliamentarians. But um, I wonder if the, 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 the panel could tell us about how pervasive <coughs> lobbying is within the health sector from tech companies who are trying to sell um, their equipment to the NHS and how effective that is. And in terms of the situational aspects you describe, Andy, um, where you know we need to tighten up rules around that. John, do you want to come in first? Yes, before I answer your second question, I just want to say a very brief word on the first one. Please. Adoption and spread. Your example is adoption. The issue is spread. And as long as it's board by board, that's not going to be easy. It's going back <coughs> to the point that Andy made. And having a, what, we, what we've labelled a once-for-Scotland approach would be a great step forward. If Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the biggest health board in Europe, decides that technology A really saves them a lot of money, why do the other 13 get to say, but we're not interested? And that happens. So this issue of spread, once for Scotland... But maybe Greater Gla Great Glasgow and Clyde are wrong. They might be, but they'll have evidence for their decision. Hmm. And that's the sort of thing we get all the time, which leads to siloisation. And we're a tiny company, uh, country. I mean, the NHS in Scotland looks after a population that's less than the size of Yorkshire. And doing it this way is not optimal, in, at least in terms of the uptake of new technology. But as far as lobbying is concerned, if you're a big global company with a big budget, you can afford to do that. One of the things that drives me is the Scottish economy economy and Scottish companies, and they are nearly all small companies. They can't afford lobbyists. They develop stuff, they work with clinicians, <coughs> they do what they can to spread the word about what they're doing. I agree with you that the hard lobbying by Big Pharma, and that we've got Big Pharma members, can be counterproductive, and sometimes they deserve that. But for most Scottish companies trying to develop a home market, so that when they go to the US and their salesman is asked, how many of these do you sell in your home market? And the answer is none. Well, why should we buy it? For small companies, and most life sciences companies in Scotland are small or medium-sized, they, they do not lobby because they can't afford to. Rather, they work with clinicians to try and get the message across. OK. Um, Alison. Convener, it's on the the question of sharing the electronic patient record and security. Professor Thumler, you spoke about how essential connectivity would be in the future if we're going to be treating more and more people out of traditional clinical settings. And obviously there have been concerns raised around the security and the privacy when it comes to sharing records. Um, in your Submission, you speak about bad press related to unauthorised data dissemination, the case of the Royal Free in London passing on rich patient data to DeepMind. I know that PA Consulting received some negative press a couple of years ago regarding uploading data sets onto a Google tool and potentially uploading patient data to, to offshore servers. And I know that you maintain you safeguarded that data appropriately, but these are obviously concerns that people have. Um, Professor Thumler, you speak about it, well, the fact that central databases are susceptible to malignant attacks and that a comprehensive merger of all existing information onto one centralised database will be almost impossible. And you also speak about a tendency for uncritical and uninformed procurement with excessive spending on technology consultants. And it seems to me there is a lot that we're asking the NHS to get its head round. It's almost like they need to be in the vanguard of of digital security, do we actually have the staff? Are we training them appropriately? Or are we always going to be running to catch up? Well, is, can I answer yes, the of course. 
Yes, um, I mean, thank you for the question. I mean, indeed, all of these things have been there, and we all know that they have been around with regard to the security. I all remind you into the, the WannaCry attack. And of course, these are the risks and the issues about centralized databases. I mean, the question is, if we are talking about the electronic health record, what do we have in mind? What are we looking at? I think the future will not be the electronic health record because we still have and will always have, and even more in the future so, will have distributed databases. They grow everywhere like mushrooms. They grow in the different NHS trusts. They grow at your GP. They're growing at your dentist, in your pharmacy, your physiotherapists. I mean, this is the problem. So it will always be a kind of a distributed database rather than a database that is sitting in one computer. And this is not too bad, actually, because it gives you a little bit more protection. Just imagine all of that data would be in one supercomputer machine. And this one supercomputer machine, even though mirrored into different locations, would be under attack. You will have a huge problem. So you don't necessarily want that. Hence why we will see more and more distributed healthcare and, consequently, distributed databases, and we need modern communication strategies. It's extremely important. I cannot stress enough how important the developments around these new technologies, 5G and so on, are. Um, the other question that you raised on how much staff and effort and so on do we need, I'm not telling you anything new when I tell you that the NHS is an organization which has come into the years. It is 70 years old. It is almost working the same way it worked back in the 40s. And of course, we need to think about new strategies, how to manage that. You know? So we have to look into how the big technology companies like Apple, how are they doing these kind of things? Big organizations like Apple, like pharmaceutical companies, they are basically going into the health market. Industry 4.0, these organizations want, don't want to sell technology devices. These organizations want to provide services in the future. So we have to get our head around the fact that in the future, many services will be provided from third parties and they just will be integrated in organizations such as the NHS. So we need a new strategy, a new structure that, that is inevitable. Huh? Yeah, Andy. Um, just to say, I, I, I agree with, with, with Professor Tumler in terms of uh, the, the, the way in which the, the, the electronic patient record needs to be distributed. That's precisely been the, the, the policy we've been pursuing for some years. We don't have, there is no one big central database for the health service as it currently stands. Uh, and Wanna Cry, which I came to this committee to explain the, the, the details of Wanna Cry behind it, uh, that wasn't anything to do with databases and, and how it was distributed. It really wasn't. So, so uh, like I say we've been pursuing uh, pursuing a, a, a policy for some years now in terms of the, uh, those those technologies in particular. It's very difficult for us to pursue the, the kind of things that, that 5G will bring to bear when there's some parts of this country don't have 3G and there's some parts don't have fibre to the cabin and, and we're, we really need to pursue. Uh, there is a, a least common denominator to a certain extent with the NHS just in terms of us trying to keep up. Um, the, the, the other companies and, and other countries that are investing, we put 2% of, um, of our NHS revenue into IT. Uh, if you go to the US, where, where Apple and some of these bigger companies will be pursuing, they're at six percent and above. You know, and 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 so so we don't we aren't, we uh, a point that I, I wanted to make generally uh, was we're kind of struggling to keep the lights on with the complexity we've already got. Innovation brings another layer that will have to be funded and, and will need to be supported uh, from a change management point of view. But I think um, you know, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to explain what we've done in terms of the architecture of the systems in Scotland. We haven't pursued the, the Big Brother type of approach in terms of a big centralised database. Uh, and we are trying to pursue, we're trying to move things to cloud and, and adopt the new technologies. Uh, but it's complex and it's going to take us time. Sorry, um, I did see you ri smile wryly when, you said that, uh, when Andy said it wasn't the database issue for that. I mean, in, it's true, you know, I mean, the, the, the problem was actually that uh, the, the files, the Microsoft files were not updated, the update patches were not loaded. Uh, in that context, uh, 
Um, it was a database problem, but it was not caused by a technical issue. It was caused by human error, if you want to or not, you know, because you did not update it. Okay, yeah. Um, but um, the the point is what you just made. I think uh, I agree with you with the spending on IT. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the absolute figures in the NHS that is spent on IT, they're quite significant. Um, on the other hand, what we had struggle to agree is I think we cannot say, well, you know, we cannot think about 5G uh, when some parts of Scotland don't even have 3G, because that would mean we would always live in the past. Scotland could never evolve to top technology because we simply don't have 3G in some areas. I mean, this, this is something which I would dispute, you know, because we need to basically play in this upper league uh, in order to give chances to our SME technology companies, because uh, they cannot develop if we don't have the infrastructure, not necessarily an NHS issue, sure, you know, because this goes into digital. This is where the problem lies. We are sitting here with a very much or very high emphasis on uh, health while we're talking about digital health. So we also need to talk about digital. I mean, where's our infrastructure? How can we? convince the telecom operators to provide these technologies, low power wide area, they have it in England, we don't have it, why is that, and so on. So in a way that holds us back. Yeah. Um, Alison, you wanted to come back in? Yeah, just to ask Mr Robertson, on that 2%, do you think that's inefficient? Does that have to change? Does it have to increase? I think it's inevitable it needs to increase. Um, <coughs> with the, the kind of digital transformation of the health service and, and that strategy is under development right now. Uh, it's, it's June, December. Um, I think we, we are at the stage now where you're going to have to invest more in IT to get returns in your business. So it's not to say that the NHS has to spend more, but I think we have to spend more on technology and innovation uh, to fund the, the inevitable kind of service transformation that has to take place. Brian? You know, I think... To, to, to speak to, to Christoph's <coughs> point, I think what, what, what I'd be interested in is the, co the comparison between um, adoption of technology in, in, in the Scottish NHS compared with a, a global marketplace, because uh, technology is never developed just for our marketplace. But with that in mind, we were, we were, um, we've developed a DHI in, in Scotland that was sp specifically designed to enable the adoption or the testing and then the adoption of, of uh, new technology into the Scottish NHS. I just wondered if the panel have any um, ideas uh, around whether that's been productive or, 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 or is there something else they should be doing uh, or, or working differently? John? I'll answer that last one first, if I may. <coughs> We've been tracking the the, the work of all of the innovation centres over the last six years. Uh, the three of them are in the life sciences area, including DHI. And we talked to our members in digital health, one of whom, Sidekit, which is based on Sky, um, Campbell Grant, its owner, was part of the DHI board at the beginning. I just, I want to speak carefully because I know I'm on the record, but Let's just say that the innovation centres have not delivered the economic benefits that the Scottish Government wanted them to deliver five years ago. And there are reasons for that which I can go into in, in detail. But there is another aspect of this, Chairman, and that is the Scottish economy. Um, <clears throat> and and, and uh, the MSP's point about other healthcare systems. Sitekit, based on Sky, an Edinburgh office developed about three years ago an e-read book. And for some of you, you'll know the postnatal document that new mothers get is the red book. Sidekit developed an e-read book. Tried to sell that to NHS Scotland. The lead clinician loved it, but procurement was an issue. Campbell is now selling that very successfully to English health trusts. They seem to have have managed to get themselves in a place where they can take on innovations like that. And Campbell has now opened an office in London with a lot of software engineers down there. And he's a proud Scot and he comes from Sky and I don't think he's going to move his company to London soon. But as our submission says, if we don't crack this one, 
within the next few years, I don't think we'll have a digital health sector left in Scotland because they'll go where the market is. Maybe you could um, write to us, follow up with information on why those innovation centres have not delivered. You can maybe put that Happy in the that. submission. Anybody else want to come in on this issue? Christoph? Uh, briefly, I mean, we have dealings with the DHI. I think the basic idea about the DHI is good, but to us, and I want to be careful here also, to us uh, at the university, on the university level, and we are involved in global 5G research. So myself, I'm the convener for the health vertical at IEEE, uh, which is a worldwide engineering association with more than a million members. And I also am also the convener of the health vertical at the 5G PPP, which is a European initiative. Um, so we are linked into this and the contribution so far to any 5G work at Napier is zero. Zero from the Scottish Government, zero from DHI. Um, and I know that Strathclyde is struggling as well. I said earlier on in England, the spending money that comes from the English government to English universities um, looks completely different. We are talking a first wave of double-digit million figures with a prospect to hundreds of million over the next year. Uh, it's being distributed over three universities in Scotland. The investment is zero. I hope this is going to change, but this is where we stand. Okay. Uh, Claire. Thank you, convener, and uh, thank you to the panel. I, I just want to pick up on, on, a, on a point that was made earlier by uh, Patricia Connolly, and I suppose it sums up a bit of some of the discussion that, we, that we've had today about you can procure a lot of the, this new technology, but actually getting people, staff, clinicians on the ground to use it can sometimes be challenging, even if we adopt a Once for Scotland approach. So if we have so many local variations, and we do even within health boards, I'm thinking particularly, you know, some surgeons operate in one way and some surgeons operate another way, even in the same department. How do we get clinicians on the ground to accept and adopt new technology and use it in their practice for the benefit of, of the health service and the patients? I think there is a real um, issue in business change, and I think that's what needs addressed in the NHS. We've been doing some work with John Jeans, who advises the Prime Minister's office in the UK on medical technology. He chairs the DHI, I should say, at the moment as well. But he's you know, very medtech savvy and been around the industry for many years, and we've been looking at some of the things that, that are coming up. And I think people are busy in the NHS. If you go into community and you want to save time and put in more monitoring that patients can use for themselves, then there's nobody to do it, really, or, or nobody with the expertise. I mean, I would always almost sort of create a team in Scotland that worked with the universities, fund the universities to bring their technologies and their companies forward and go in and analyse the situation and spend some time and money in changing, let's say, would management at home, diabetes, chronic care, pick it out, but send in a business change team as well as simply um, the, the clinical. And when it's implemented well in a small community, roll it out, mandate it as, as, as the way to do things. Once you've proved you've got those cost savings in, in the area, we, we've talked about this, I'm sure, Christoph and, and others many, many times. How do we get over this barrier? And I think it's going to take a different type of look. And I would get other providers like, like the Apples and Googles, etc., involved. In fact, there may be obviously um, some incentive for them, some, some funding to come from them. They will make the money in lots of different ways from adverts, you know, not directly from selling services. So I don't think we should be too afraid if people are happy on social media and, and in, in different types of monitoring to interact with some of the big providers to start thinking outside the box a bit about how we do some of the savings. To, to understand that um, there will be certain requirements that have to be satisfied. And I don't think you can underestimate how important it is to have the end users as part of the development process. So what you do is you have them at the ground invested in the innovation as it moves forward. What you then have is an invested stakeholder who wants to see the success of that innovation. What you then have is key opinion leaders that can then take that and can roll that out to their colleagues and they can underpin all of the... Sorry, Elaine, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but you're using a lot of jargon there. Apologies. Key stakeholders, end users. Yep. 
if you just in, in plain English, please. Okay, Thank apologies. You. People who are going to use the technology need to know why it is useful for them. What is it going to do for them? What improvements is it going to have for them? If they are involved in the process of developing that, rather than have a solution imposed upon them, they are much more likely to be invested in using that. So you're talking about clinicians here? Or are you talking about patients? At this, for this particular question, I'm talking about clinicians. I'm talking so about the people that will see how a benefit do we do from that? it. How do we actually do that? I suppose the, what the committee is looking for is, is some answers. Yeah. So we talked earlier about there being lots of people in the innovation landscape that can bring lots of different skills to bear. I think it's important to realise that the NHS also has an important role to play in that, so they should be part of a development team. So while there is technology out within industry, within SMEs, they can bring part of the jigsaw puzzle, but the clinicians, the NHS working from the inside out, also have a role to play to show how important it is in bringing that technology, what will be required, the infrastructure, the training, how it will fit in with their current practices, whether there's going to be um, changes required to care pathways. If they're actually in at the beginning, then what you have is technology that develops in a way that's going to be useful for the people that are actually going to use it. Saeed? Yeah, and to pick up your point about patients or people who access services, they need to be at the heart of this as well, so that we're building solutions that address real rather than perceived needs. So that's called co-design, about involving people and actually creating those services, understanding their needs, not building something no one is, want, is going to use. Um, we've got a great example of that called our GP. We have collaborated with over a thousand citizens and practice staff in creating three innovative GP digital services, which are there for potential implementation. We also, in terms of adoption, need to look at the awareness of digital health and care amongst the public. What do they know about it? In England, where they made pervasive access to GP digital services, still very low take up, and that's because most people there didn't know those services existed. What marketing is going to happen? What is going to happen in terms of public awareness and changing the way people think about how they access the NHS? And what are we going to do about the digital skills of people to access those services? A fundamental statistic is a third of people with long-term conditions do not use the internet. How are we going to bring them on board? And how are we going to do this in a way that doesn't increase or enhance um, health inequalities? So I think we can look at structures, we can look at clinicians, we can look at the NHS, but until we involve and look at people, we're not going to solve this problem. Uh, Alex? everything that Saeed just said. I, I just wanted to add to that, that um, you know, one of the points that we've started to, pull, to, to, to land on from Claire's question and from some of what Patricia said earlier, um, you know, increasingly the technology that, that we need to deliver better health and social care it exists. It's becoming increasingly commoditized and as a result it's becoming easier and easier uh, to, to actually buy. Um, so, so that's kind of moved the focus onto some of the things that we've been talking about. So decision making, technology selection, and then the work to develop and implement it and deliver the business change around it. And um, you know, one of the things that we see most commonly actually is, is that um, the skills and capability and actually the capacity of people to do that work aren't readily available within um, the NHS and other health and social care organisations. So for me, the key is about um, making sure that those skills and capabilities are, are firstly made available so that you can do the work to select and implement the technology, but also that they're being built on an ongoing basis so that increasingly um, uh, health and social care organisations can actually take responsibility for delivering technology themselves, which is something that doesn't happen as much as it should at the moment. Briefly, Crystal. Uh, I think it's a very important point that you made. Um, I think this is extremely important. So we, it is clear that the NHS as such does not have many of the skills that are needed to come up with the technologies we are talking about here and we are envisaging. So we need to uh, really somehow build these collaborations with uh, skills that we have in Scotland. We have excellent universities, we have departments that have skills that can be more than useful to the development and to the implementation, but we are not making use enough of these um, of these skills and resources that we have. And I think this is one of the, uh, the very important things that we have to do. We have to bring the skills, the resources that are there here in Scotland together to manage these processes, exactly as you said. Okay, John. Just 
Ms. Hoggy's question. There are two barriers, and I'm, I'm afraid I am going to use a bit of jargon. One of them is we call clinician uh, autonomy. A doctor can take the decisions that she or he thinks are the right ones for the patient, no matter what. And you may say, but this, this new way of doing it is much better. It costs half. That doesn't matter. This one works. I know it works. And I am not going to change my mind. Now, that's not an insurmountable barrier, but you've got to know it's there to work out how to get past it. And <clears throat> another one is service redesign. Many new technologies and innovations need the whole process to be redesigned. And I would add to what uh, Christoph has said, that not only um, do we need expertise about taking on innovative systems, but the, the previous chief executive of the NHS Scotland said to me, this is like trying to redesign and rebuild an aircraft while it stays flying. And doing the service redesign while the service is still helping patients is a very tough job. But in terms of solutions, you, I, I see very well why you're looking for solutions. One thing that we've toyed with is that boards should be given, dare I say it, an aspiration, I'm not going to use the word target, somehow or other, the adoption and spread of innovation should be part of what boards are expected to do. And if they don't do it, then questions are asked. At the moment, that doesn't really happen. I'll come back to that point in a minute, Patricia. I just wanted to, to maybe echo a bit what uh, Zahid was saying and talk about the people or the users. I mean, if you look at a lot of the adoption of technology for self-monitoring, then when you actually put it in the hands of people, patients, it is very well received. And I, I go back to something we said in our own submission, NHS Florence, all you need to do to be monitored by Florence is to be able to text, answer some questions or take a, a fairly simple measurement. On, on an instrument and the patients overwhelmingly uh, really like this system, whether it's for diabetes, blood pressure, heart failure, we've tested it a little bit for, um, for, for wound care. However, it's becoming very diff difficult to actually disseminate yet again because it pushes the clinician into a different way of working. Who's going to look at the Florence results? Who's going to talk to the patient if they need to talk to a clinician. So I think there is a barrier for patients and, and one of them is that we're not actually providing them access to these technologies to see how they can improve and how their mental well-being improves as well once they feel that they're being monitored anyway if they've got a, a chronic condition. Uh, Marie. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, some of the cultural barriers that there are within the NHS to this. So I, I was looking particularly at this Attend Anywhere pilot, which I'm a, I'm a Highlands and Islands representative. It's absolutely key that we cut down on journeys to hospitals for routine outpatient appointments. We need to be doing that in a systematic way that will save us huge sums of money, save us flights. I mean, as a busy working mum, it will make the people who are using the healthcare system a lot more able to be a lot more productive while they interact with the healthcare system. I'm so disappointed to see that only one patient was enrolled in six months. And I can, I mean, that's not a new technology at all. It's not a difficult technology to use. Those must be cultural barriers. Those must be, you know, barriers that, uh, amongst the patient group who expect to be able to go face to face and see a, a, a doctor, and barriers amongst the doctors who like to have a patient in front of them. And I just wonder how on earth do we do I mean, you know, the, the, the savings and the improvement in service is so obvious. We can't do it for that. And the technology is not even new. If we can't do it for that, how are we going to do it for anything? Um, well, the Attend Anywhere, I'm familiar with that from, from within the NHS. And, and it hasn't been that bad. I think maybe the example you've got from one of the submissions was, was A, was it a particular surgery that, that had uh, only one, one uptake? But that has proved quite popular with clinicians. And I think it's very helpful if you can identify uh, technologies that become popular with the clinicians who then have to amend their back-end way of working. It's this business change element that we were talking to before. Uh, and I think that they, they see that as, as being helpful to them uh, in the short term and in the long term, especially in remote and rural locations where, where that kind of uh, contact 
becomes quite critical. In fact, we've taken that technology and put it into secondary care now, and GPs are using that to contact the secondary care clinicians and, and to be able to help them with the, the assessment of patient results. So it's that kind of, that's, that's, it's a kind of an inevitable march of technologies when you put that type of, and, it, and admittedly it's not advanced technology, but it is a big step forward for a GP who's, who's trying to manage a, a, broad base of, uh, a broad base of patients. But some patients like that, some patients like going to their GP, if that's the point in terms of culture and, and that side of things. Uh, but but I, I think we, we need to stick with these things and, and make sure that they're, they're available and we give choice to patients as, as the kind of technology um, kind of uh, adoption flows through the country. It'd be wrong to give up on these things, I think, and, and, and put them on the, on the back burner. Yes, sorry. Sorry. I mean, you raise a, an interesting point here. I mean, we don't just dump technology in the <coughs> NHS and amongst clinicians and with people. There needs to be a lot of investment in change management and actually the softer stuff, the cultural change that's required, the training, the time to actually understand this technology and how to use it properly and change processes and change thinking. That investment isn't taking place, and that needs to happen across the spectrum. We're just putting money into the hardware and the software. We're not putting it into those softer elements. Yeah. And that's where the success lies. We've got lots of innovation. We've got lots of technology, but it's not being rolled out, and it's not being used. Yeah. We, we've, we've taken evidence on NHS governments that's told us that, that in the current climate, where budgets are declining, that people have less time for training and less time for doing things like this. So that ties in with that evidence and another... Uh, area that we're looking at. Uh, <coughs> anyone else? In, Marie, do you, have you got any follow-up? Christoph, did you want in on this? Exactly. You know, just a word of warning. You know, I mean, the, the systems we are talking here about. You know, telemedicine, basically. Yeah, uh, there's a problem. You know, medicine is not only see and speak and hear. Medicine is touch and feel and smell and everything. So, from a physician's perspective or GP's perspective, if you want, if I can only see the patients, I might miss out on a lot. Uh, so I, I love to have them close by and also touch and feel and so on and basically make an assessment that clears out the whole process where I can really get a result. Yeah. Um, but again, there is technology, there is there is progress on that front. So we're talking now about things like the tactile internet, where you can actually remotely touch people. And I'm sure more of these things will uh, are to come. And I'm making my point again, without communication technology, it's not going to work. So there are reasons why these technologies don't experience an explosive uptake. Yeah, um, But I think they will come. It just will take time. But we also need to build on our digital infrastructures to enable them. Yeah. Um, the, I was looking at the dictionary definition of innovation. It says a new method, idea, or product. Um, innovation's got a very positive connotation, but some innovation might not be positive. Um, for example, a few um, years ago, you would have to physically walk to the doctors to make an appointment. Now you phone up. But if you phone up and you have to phone 96 times, as one person recently reported to me that they did, to try and get an appointment, then that is not an an innovation that is necessarily a positive innovation. So, and and I use that just as an example uh, to make the point. If um, innovation is coming in, are we evaluating current practice adequately to assess whether we need innovation to improve services or whether innovation is coming in to try and, you know, um, patch over a hole in the system? John. Uh, if I could take innovation and bring it down to medical devices, my information is that there are well over 40,000 different medical devices in use <coughs> every day by NHS Scotland. The Scottish Health Technology Group, which is the bit of the NHS that does the assessment, much as the SMC does for drugs, has probably over the last five years since it was set up assessed about 60 of these. I'm that's a very rough, it's an, but it's right as an order of magnitude. Now, you've touched on assessment, and I just wanted to point to the scale of that as an issue. Now, SHTG have developed a fast assessment method called the Innovative Medical Technologies Overview Process, which has got 
a maximum uh, 12 week program and we like it very much because SMEs find it easy to use and it gives them a fast response. And sometimes the most useful response is we will never buy that. It's good that they know that quickly so that they don't waste money. This is for devices you're For talking. devices. And where does this fit in with the MHRA? Well, um, one aspect of that assessment is that you have to have uh, uh, an e-marking, uh, you know, an EU uh, regulatory marking for your product. That's taken as given. Um, it's similar to the that's with, um, for pharmaceutical products, so the MHRA licences the devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the and, and the uh, Scottish Tech. And then you make a decision whether that goes into the NHS. Is that how it works? Yes, a, a company trying to sell the NHS that doesn't have a CE marking mm -hmm. will not sell it. That's right. that's a, everyone knows, understands that. Maybe but just for the, clarification, John. Yes, John. Sorry, SHTG doesn't say whether you can sell to NHS no. or not. I think that was maybe the the misunderstanding. They don't allow the sale. You can go in. Anyway. Sorry, sorry. It, yeah. it is the. It is the case that the NHS will never buy anything that doesn't have a CE marking or other regulatory approval. But <clears throat> the issue of, us, of assessing it in terms of will this innovation pay for itself, will it deliver what we are talking about around this table, is a difficult one because of the scale. These 40,000 odd devices, most of them have just been sold to the NHS and are in use, even some of the more innovative ones. But the Innovative Medical Technologies Overview process is a step, a huge step in the right direction. So and we I don't know if they'll provide value for money or do what they say on the tin? For most of them, um, that may be the case. Patricia. Well, maybe if I could say, say a bit more, as somebody also connected to an SME and working with, with SMEs and bigger companies, most companies put an enormous amount of effort into gathering evidence for the benefits of the device and in doing calculations around the health, health costs. So these are provided as papers by the companies to NHS and most devices will not move to sale unless you can show such benefits. Again, I think the problem comes that whether you have these papers or not, every group in NHS wants to pilot the device for themselves. So again, this exhausting process for staff and everybody else, but it would be unfair to say that the medical device industry does not put great efforts into um, the efficacy and the costing of its devices. Yeah, we've seen the cost in regards to how some devices impact on patients. Unfortunately, it's a very high cost yeah. as well. Uh, Elaine. Working with the NHS, we have created a, an innovative environment that lets clinicians and healthcare workers come to us with ideas for innovation. We have a responsibility to make sure that this is actually something that can go on and be developed into something that will be useful. Now, I think we talked about um, very geographic um, ideas that will work specifically in one area but may not necessarily work in a wider area. So part of what we do is a very full evaluation of the proposed technology before we even determine if this is something that we should develop further. And that will bring in all aspects of whether this is a good idea, whether there is already a solution, whether perhaps they're trying to solve a problem that has already been solved in other areas, um, whether it's an IP position, wh whether the technology is currently available. So that will all happen before we even start to, to develop IP. and. Um, as it currently stands, we probably only move forward with approximately one in 10 innovations that come to us from the NHS. Uh, there's always a, a good reason, a good explanation as to why we wouldn't necessarily move forward with those. And sometimes it's just about people putting people in contact with areas where there's already development going on in that area. So we don't want to start to, to reinvent the wheel. And that comes back very firmly to the idea where if there's some kind of coordinated effort towards innovation, we can actually identify pockets and we can put people together and help them to work together towards a solution rather than have many different solutions in place throughout the country. Could I just clarify something? When they, they go through the process, then ultimately they have to go to each health board to then analyse. So going through that whole process, then they go through <coughs> another 14 processes. Yeah. Yes, even if you have SHTG endorsement or you've 
had a big green tick from the innovative medical technology <coughs> assessment, you've still got to sell your product board by board. Okay. For most, I know there are big strategic procurements that are yeah. done centrally. But, but for, each board would review the papers and review all of that yeah. stuff to see. So we've got another 14 okay. rounds. To and that, that's okay. the spread issue. Sorry. Is that very similar to the, so the SMC process technically for pharmaceuticals is the same that you get a central approval this is for use in NHS Scotland and then each health board um, decides and assesses whether there is a role for that drug within their own health board is that a similar thing that and, that, and that happens quite routinely within a certain period yes. of time of the central pronouncement there is a question is, is should it there is a similarity but as far as I know, you, the NHS would not take on a drug in Scotland unless it's been through the SMC process, unless it's a uh -huh. cheap generic or something. So, so the fundamental difference with the, the technology assessment is that, is that you can get through without the central assessment. Exactly, and there are so many of them. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, but really, we really are running very short of time, and I want to give everybody an opportunity <coughs> to make one final comment. We've got. Um, there's a number of points that have been raised, and it's been very interesting discussion this morning. I mean, I suppose it's a very, it's a very cliched way of doing it, but uh, you know, that's that's me. Um, uh, if 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 you were want to get your tuppence worth into developing the strategy going forward, then you know, what's your key point that you want to put, <coughs> put in, and we'll we'll go round the table and ask you to do that, uh, Patricia. I would ensure that the innovation pipeline from university right through to NHS is, is properly funded, particularly I think the university end is neglected. And in that funding, I would ensure that patient groups are brought in, uh, the, the, the real end users, and that they help in the development and testing of products and, and incoming technologies. John? My point would be that we've got pretty good strategies and we don't really need another one. We need to make the ones we've got work. And I would like to support uh, a one-liner that Andy has drafted in his submission to you, the NSS one. At the heart of the main failures of strategy has been the inability to translate the strategy, governance and relationships into consistent widespread delivery. That's at the core of everything we've been talking about. Uh, we, we have strategies most years but it's seeing a change that matters. Yeah. Andy? Um, yeah, I, th I think we've got a very sound foundation. I, I'm not sure that's come through today, but again, I, I want to make that point that the, the systems and the, the infrastructure that we have is a sound foundation. But as I've said earlier on, um, if we truly <coughs> want to be innovative and start to, to really start to, to change and to, to transform the NHS's services, then we're going to have to uh, look at a different methods of, of investment and of bringing in um, new technologies into our environment. Um, the governance and the linkages to uh, the academic world and, and a different flow and, and, and a, a recognised single funnel for innovations are all things that could be done on the back of the new strategy. What do you mean by different methods of investment? Um, I, I think the, the, the perhaps looking to... Um, uh, the e-health e funds that we have in place today is, is the 2%. And if that can't be bolstered any, I, I think we're going to have to look at other ways in which we bring uh, investment in to be able to support the deployment of new technology. So again, whether that's uh, counting on, on reductions in costs in other parts of the health service that, that technology can support, uh, or indeed looking for new investment from, from a government decisions, um, I, I'm not sure. But I think we need that, that increased investment to be able to bring the innovation to bear uh, faster than it is today. Thank you. Elaine? I think um, don't underestimate the innovative nature of the NHS and the talent and ability within the NHS to, to innovate. I think clear roles and responsibilities in the innovative environment to help to coordinate all of the, the various bodies that can come and can help innovation. Um, is an important message to leave you with. Thank you. So, I would echo what Patricia said in that we need to have co-design as part of the strategy involving people and also third sector in creating and designing the solutions. I'd also just add that the last strategy didn't have an implementation plan and that's why we fail to see the progress that uh, we want to see 
We don't know who was to deliver what and when it was to be delivered by. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we still don't have any widespread national patient-facing service, not even for online booking appointments or pre-prescription offering, <coughs> and that can't continue. And I think we need to see some coordination in terms of innovation. We need a national innovation lead or someone that will take this strongly and help coordinate all the partners involved. The key thing is leadership, is it? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. so that's something we didn't get there, we should have got to, but just time has, time has been there. Uh, Christoph. Yeah, um, I think uh, I was asked to clarify 5G PPP, so it's the 5G private public partnership, which is a European technology program that is uh, running between uh, 2012 or 13 and 2020. But um, uh, the input is, I think we need to have another look how the NHS R&D development funds are distributed. I think, in my opinion, it does not make sense that each trust is trying to develop their own things, or even if it's controlled by agencies and on an NHS-only basis. We need to enhance the collaboration of the NHS with outside companies, SMEs in Scotland, universities, we need that, as Patricia already said. And I think what is also very important, we need to give NHS time, NHS staff protected time when they're doing trials on things, because you cannot ask a workforce that stands with their back at the wall to trial new things. The outcome will not be good. Nobody would do that. I think this is very important. Alex. Um, so, uh, I guess... I would say that in almost every instance, the technology that we need um, to deliver excellent health and social care in Scotland uh, exists, um, and, and therefore the challenge is establishing the right conditions um, to put it in place. So for me, that covers off a lot of what we've discussed today. So uh, making sure that there's sufficient um, clinician and patient involvement in uh, developing and deploying the technology, um, making sure there's uh, strong top-down and at times directive leadership um, to indicate how the technology should be deployed um, uh, consistently across the system. Uh, as, as we've talked about a lot, there needs to be sufficient investment in business change to actually um, you know, m make deployment successful on the ground. Um, I, I think we need to embrace uh, the modern technologies that we've been talking about, um, and in particular, um, the methods for deploying them. Um, and I, I guess finally, uh, you know, we need to be proportionate about the way that we apply governance uh, to some of the projects and programmes that are charged with bringing about technology. Um, I, I guess one kind of slightly wider observation is that I, um, I always get a bit concerned when people talk about uh, establishing a single place for innovation within um, an organisation or a system, because I think that can actually um, often prevent innovation from happening elsewhere. Okay. Uh, can I thank everyone very much. It's been very interesting, just interesting discussion, and we will uh, be taking this forward and many of the points that you have raised will uh, give us food for thought. If there's any um, subsequent information that you want to provide to the committee then please please do um, and we will now go into private session as we previously agreed. Thanks very much. <laughs>